current staffing levels, demands for services, and recruitment and retention initiatives at, at the police department and requesting the police department to report. Members of the public who wish to provide public comment on this hearing may line up to speak uh, when we do call for public comment. And if you are joining us remotely, you please call 415-655-0001, enter the meeting ID of 2491-567-5344, then press pound and pound again. Once connected to the meeting, you will press star three to enter the speaker line. A system prompt will indicate you have raised your hand. Please wait until we take public comment on this item and when the system indicates you have been unmuted, that will be your cue to begin your comment. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And I want to note that we're joined by Supervisor Mandelman for this hearing. Thank you, who's co-sponsoring it, I believe. And thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for calling for this very important and timely hearing on police staffing levels. The floor is yours. Thank you, Supervisor. One moment. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Supervisors, and good morning. My Actually, name is- Actually, um, before you begin, I just want to introduce um, a few comments as to why I called the hearing, if that's fine with you. Um, but thank you so much for being here. And I, I just want to explain to everyone why I've asked um, the San Francisco Police Department on present, to present on uh, the police staffing issues that we continue to hear about. And I want to thank Chair Mar for scheduling this hearing and my thanks to Supervisor Safai for co-sponsoring. I called this hearing because we know in March of 2020, an independent study on police staffing levels found that the San Francisco Police Department needed to hire 330 officers to meet the demand for service at that time. And the demand of service is defined by, of course, those that are making calls into our system. Uh, since then, the need for officers has grown to over 500. It's our understanding. We hear Chief Scott uh, mention that uh, at s several different points. And we know that it's projected to be over 700 by the end of the fiscal year. I believe that this is a crisis and dire um, situation um, when you understand how that plays out in reality and how that plays out on the streets and what that means for people who are calling for service. We can't meet the demand for service with those numbers. We can't implement necessary criminal justice reform and we can't protect our most vulnerable residents. Since we just had a hearing about the hate crimes increase um, with our AAPI community. We cannot do those things with an understaffed police department. Uh, also, uh, the Chronicle has said even over the last two years, we know that crime is on the rise in some categories. Burglaries have increased by approximately 40% in San Francisco. Some neighborhoods have increased as high as 78%. I know that many neighborhoods in my district of District 2 uh, have increased more than others. And even, you know, I've lived here for 21 years. I have a 17 year old son, I have a 12 year old daughter. Uh, anecdotally, we all feel something's different. We all hear more, we all see more. I, I've been in politics here since 2007 in constituent relations as a legislative aide for nine years, now a supervisor for five. It's different. We hear more complaints, we hear more worries, we see more struggles, and we know we need to do something. Also, we know that um, Supervisor Safai revealed in his hearing on retail theft um, that shoplifting um, continues to be out of control in San Francisco when you look at other cities. CVS has more than 150 locations in the Bay Area and their 12 San Francisco stores account for more than 40% of the region's total losses from shoplifting. Similarly, Walgreens reported that their local stores had four times the theft. 35 times the spending on guard services and 20 times the number of workplace threats as their stores in other cities, including New York and Chicago. We know that this is absolutely unacceptable. Our merchants and residents have a right to feel safe in their homes and neighborhoods, and we have to invest in proven practices that deter and prevent crime, and that begins with ensuring that we have a fully staffed and well-trained, and I mean well-trained, police force. We have the obligation to do that as elected officials in the city and county of San Francisco. We know that it's no secret that San Francisco, the San Francisco Police Department has struggled to recruit and retain sworn officers. A generation of experienced officers are in the process of retiring and we have not been able to recruit enough to replace those who leave. And of course, we know that's for several reasons. Police staffing in San Francisco lags behind other peer cities. And I think it's very important to note this. New York has 42 officers for every 10,000 residents. Chicago has 44. 
Washington, D.C. has 61, and San Francisco only has 22, and that number might be even lower considering all those that are leaving. Our existing force is stretched far too thin. With almost 80% of officer time committed to responding to emergency 911 calls, the San Francisco Police Department cannot properly staff crime prevention efforts. Preventative measures that we all call for, that we all want to see in our neighborhoods, that we all want to see in our merchant corridors like footbeat patrols are essential to establishing visibility, building community relations, and deterring crime. Without an adequately staffed police force, preventative measures go out the door. And while police are focused on prioritizing urgent calls for service, they can't do that very important work. Emergency calls for service have increased since the beginning of last year. The most dangerous incidents, priority A calls, increased by 12%. Priority A calls, for those that don't know, are those are of imminent threat of harm, something that is in progress or something that just occurred, and a serious risk to the public. Priority, those calls have increased by 12%. And more troubling is that because of the lack of police staffing, response times have slowed, which means San Franciscans who called 911 are waiting longer for help to arrive. Unfortunately, this trend we know did not begin today. Over the last six years, San Francisco's monthly priority aid calls have increased by 33%, while police response times have decreased by 25%. Without meaningful investment in staffing, this trend will continue. In 2016, the Department of Justice and the San Francisco Police Department entered into an agreement to enhance police accountability, eliminate bias, expand community engagement, minimize use of force, and diversify department staff. All incredibly important and absolutely necessary issues and things to do. And as part of that agreement, we know that the Department of Justice issued 272 recommendations, and the San Francisco Police Department has worked incredibly hard to implement more than 90% of these measures to date. This, I believe, is a significant achievement, and San Francisco is the only city, and this should be this should be called out, it's not often, you hear the worst, it's the only city of its size to voluntarily, can I say that again, voluntarily implement reforms of this magnitude. And I thank Chief Scott and everyone who's involved for doing so because we know it's absolutely necessary to have the best police department um, in this nation, which I know the city is capable of and one that protects all its citizens. However, systemic change requires serious investment, and the San Francisco Police Department will not be able to sustain this progress without ongoing support. For more than two years, we've known that our patrol staffing levels were severely inadequate, and that needs to change. It's one of the reasons why I voted no on the budget two years ago, because we weren't investing in public safety to the level that we should. San Francisco is not alone when it comes to staffing challenges. Oakland is also in crisis. Their city council recently passed legislation authorizing two more academy classes and is also considering expanding incentive pay. San Francisco, in my opinion, needs to follow suit or we will fall further behind and we need to figure out how to recruit more officers. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye to the conditions in our city or ignore the thousands of San Franciscans who call 911 in crisis every single day. I am absolutely committed to ensuring our public safety agencies are staffed and prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. San Franciscans deserve nothing less, and I thank you all for your service. I called this hearing so that San Francisco Police Department could report on this incredibly dire and important situation, and so you can present to us creative solutions to improve hiring, recruitment, and retention. So with that, I wanna um, welcome I, I see Supervisor Mandelman on the roster, but I just want to say we will hear a presentation from Commander Nicole Jones and Celeste Berg, and available for questions are on Deputy Chiefs Robert O'Sullivan, David, Dave Lazar, um, I think Daniel Perret, yes, Perret, there you are, um, Acting Deputy Chief Raj Viswani, Acting Commander James Ahern, um, and if I missed anyone, I apologize, but that's just on my list. So thank you very much for being here. I'll turn it over to Supervisor Mandelman. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Um, I just want to uh, thank you for this for this hearing. Um, there is no uh, task of government that is more basic or fundamental than keeping its people and their property safe. Um, and in that regard, I am very concerned about where San Francisco is today. Um, and uh, this hearing speaks to concerns that I'm hearing from my constituents on a daily basis. 
Um, so I don't generally uh, just pop into my colleagues' hearings, but this was one that I thought was particularly important to be at. And um, I do think if we are not at crisis levels now, we are approaching them and we need to act rapidly to um, attract more officers and to retain the ones we have. And so I'm interested in hearing more from the department. Um, Supervisor Stephanie, I also just wanted to share some remarks and just thank you so much for calling for this hearing and, um, and, and really look forward to the presentation on the updated staffing analysis from the department. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, former President, Board President Yee's work on these issues and, um, and really leading to the Proposition E that, that was passed by voters um, and, um, and that, that moved us to more of a, a data-based or, or data-driven um, uh, analysis and approach to police staffing. So, um, so I think this is, we're in a much better situation to, to have this discussion and, you know, today and, um, and look forward to the, the presentation. And I, th these are also very important issues, obviously, to my, my district, and I think all, all of us throughout the city. Um, and we certainly hear from constituents, residents, small businesses, especially about the need for uh, the city to address um, the, the understaffing of our police department. So thank you. Hey, thank you, supervisors. Um, my name is Nicole Jones. I'm the commander of SFPD's Administration Bureau. Within our Administration Bureau, we have the Staffing and Deployment Unit, and I'd like to introduce Celeste Berg, who's our Senior Analyst for the Staffing and Deployment Unit. Her and her team were responsible for the analyses and compilation of the Proposition E Staffing Report, which we are going to present on today. Thank you. Great, thanks, Commander, and good morning, Chair Mar, Supervisor Stephanie, Supervisor Haney, and Supervisor Mandelman. Uh, we do have a presentation, and I'll wait for that to be pulled up. Great, thank you so much. Next slide, please. First, some background and context on our analysis. Thank you so much for supervisors for uh, alluding to this as well. But in 2017, the Board of Supervisors, with support from the mayor, adopted resolution number 63-17, which urged our department and the police commission to form a task force on strategic police staffing. And the goal of forming this task force was to determine the best methodologies for establishing SFPD staffing levels. As directed, our department did form the staffing task force in 2018, and I'll go over the membership in more detail in just a moment, but it included community members, nationally renowned police staffing experts, city partners, police commissioners, and internal stakeholders from our department as well. And in tandem, SFPD also hired outside consultant, Matrix Consulting Group, to do two things. First, to develop methodologies for establishing staffing levels for our department, and second, to actually conduct a comprehensive staffing analysis of our department. And throughout 2018 and 2019, Matrix Consulting Group conducted their analysis and met with the task force along the way to share uh, results and also to vet the methodologies that were being used throughout the study as well. And then Matrix Consulting Group released the results of their report in 2020. And I think, sorry, a little feedback. Uh, if somebody <laughs> has their telephone or listening device on, if you can go ahead and turn that off. All right, I think we're all good. <laughs> somebody has a broadcast uh, of our meeting going on in the audience. Thank you very much. All right. Um, and in March of 2020, Matrix Consulting Group released the results of their analysis two years ago. And then, of course, in November 2020, voters approved Proposition E, which mandates that our department conduct a comprehensive staffing analysis every odd year for a presentation to the Commission, the Board of Supervisors, and the Mayor's Office. And in 2021, we began conducting our analysis, and then in mid-2021, the Police Commission adopted Resolution Number 21-60, which prescribes the staffing analysis methodologies to be used in the report. And one thing I'll say here is that the methodologies prescribed for our analysis are the exact same as those that were used by outside consulting group Matrix in their 2020 report and vetted by the staffing task force as well. 
So this, this project is the culmination of many years worth of effort from many stakeholders as well. Next slide, please. And very briefly to go over the staffing task force membership, we did have community members, we had two nationally renowned police staffing experts, we had city partners from DPA, GEM, and the controller's office, we had three police commissioners, and once again, internal stakeholders from SFPD as well. And the task force did meet six times throughout 2018 and 2019 to review the methodologies proposed by Matrix and review the results of the report. Next slide, please. And to go into the methodologies used, first and foremost, the workload-based methodology. And this analysis uses calls for service, which represents the demand for police services from the public, and a target percentage of time devoted to community engagement to determine recommended staffing levels for patrol officers. And one thing I'll say here is that this workload-based methodology is the industry best practice, and it has been used in previous analyses on department staffing. So, of course, including the Matrix Consulting Group analysis in 2020. In 2018, the controller's office did a car sector patrol analysis and also used a calls-for-service workload-based methodology. And the Police Executive Research Forum used a workload-based methodology in 2008. And you can see on the visual here how this model works. So first and foremost, we look at the percentage of time devoted to responding to calls for service. And here I'll say that this, is, this does not include on-view incidents. This only includes calls for service in which a member of the public calls to request law enforcement assistance. The model also considers the percentage of time devoted to administrative tasks. So this includes things such as report writing, stop data entry, body-worn camera footage tagging, signing off on department bulletins, meals, gas, et cetera. And then the final component of the model is the, per the target percentage of time devoted to community engagement and proactive policing. And so this includes everything from when our officers are not simply running from call to call to call. So this includes serving as a visible law enforcement presence in the community. It includes interacting with residents, merchants, visitors, youth, and also, for example, uh, implementing strategies around gun violence prevention and other issues that the city is facing. And I'll turn it over to Commander Jones just to speak a bit about the consequence of not having dedicated time for community engagement and proactive policing. Thank you. Um, supervisors, I was the captain at Ingleside Station prior to this assignment as the commander of Administration Bureau. And really, we need this time to be able to do everything else that isn't a 911 call for service and related to it in the administrative sphere. So oftentimes, supervisors would reach out to me, and you get concerns from your constituents, our community members. We have complex problem-solving efforts going on. We want to be at events. We want to be engaging with the community. And if we're moving from call to call to call to call, there is no time for that. So we're really looking to build public trust and preserve this 30% so we can do everything else. I think we've gotten to the point where the community expects it from us. We want to be able to deliver and deliver robustly. Thanks, Commander. And the last thing I will say here is that the 30% time target devoted to proactive policing and community engagement is the exact same time target used by Matrix Consulting Group in 2020. And then the workload-based methodology does take several forms. We went over the calls for service analysis because that's, of course, the, the largest portion of our department. But, for example, in investigations, we also used a workload-based methodology. So here we look at the number of cases and the time that it takes to work each case in order to establish recommended staffing levels for investigative units. Uh, next slide, please. And then the ratio-based methodology is utilized when recommended staffing scales based on the value of another metric. So an example here is the police organization standard for span of control, which is one sergeant to six officers to provide adequate street-level supervision. And then the fixed post methodology is utilized when recommended staffing is determined based on operational coverage needs. 
So an example here is the SWAT team, where positions and teams must be staffed across time of day and day of week to provide operational coverage for the department. And then finally, the non-scaling methodology is utilized when recommended staffing does not correspond to workload or scale to the value of another metric. And an example here is the Equal Employment Opportunity Coordinator position in which staffing is mandated by statute. Next slide, please. And the results of the staffing analysis indicate that SFPD has a significant staffing deficit across both sworn and non-sworn professional staff. So you can see that the table here shows the full department view by bureau, and on the sworn side, this does include all ranks, and it also includes professional staff as well. And the recommended numbers generated by the analysis show that SFPD needs 2,182 sworn members and 554 professional staff. And I will go over the comparison to current in just a moment here, but just want to provide uh, some high-level takeaways on the sworn side. The first is that the majority of the deficit between current and recommended is in the Field Operations Bureau and at the district station specifically. So once again, this is on the sector patrol side where the numbers are generated using the workload-based calls for service analysis but then there is also resource need identified in specialized station assignments like footbeats, like homeless outreach, like housing officers, plain clothes, et cetera. Next slide, please. And this table compares current staffing to recommended and also compares the results of our analysis to the results that were generated by Matrix, Matrix's analysis two years ago. So two important takeaways here. The first is the recommended sworn number. You can see from this table that the number generated by Matrix Consulting Group's analysis in 2020 is 2,176. Our 2021 analysis yielded the recommended sworn figure of 2,182. And the takeaway here is that these numbers are virtually identical. It's just six sworn members different and that represents less than a third of 1%. So the finding is that our recommended sworn number is aligned with previous department studies. The second important finding is that the current sworn, the, the deficit between current sworn and recommended has increased um, first over the last two years, but also over the last six months in particular, and that's due to our declining staffing levels. And really quickly, just want to say here that the current sworn count, it represents all of our sworn members, less those individuals who are on disability leave, and less academy recruits. So this is slightly different than our citywide full duty sworn number, which does take out all other, all individuals who are on some sort of less than full duty status. So it will also take out individuals who are on TMD, who are on military leave, who are on family and medical leave. But this current sworn figure here only takes out DP and only takes out academy recruits. And the reasoning here is that these are longer term leaves and individuals that are um, not working and not on some sort of intermittent leave. And we'll go over in our current staffing metrics in just a moment here, but just wanted to make that clarification right now. And you can see here, first, that the additional staffing required has increased over the last two years. So when Matrix Consulting Group conducted their analysis, the additional staffing required was 265. When we conducted our analysis in September 2021 is when we started to compile our quantitative and qualitative data and actually put together the report, the deficit was 352. But even six months later, that number has grown to 459. And that's due to the fact that just in the last six months, our department has lost over 100 sworn members. And once again, we'll be going into detail on our, our current staffing and, and the themes and factors there. But the two important takeaways from this table are, first, that the results of our analysis are in line with the analysis conducted two years ago. And second, the deficit has grown significantly due to the fact that our staffing levels continue to decline. 
Next slide, please. This shows the results of the Metro Division, which, of course, includes five of our uh, district stations in the downtown corridor. The takeaway here is that 860 sworn members across all ranks are required in the Metro Division, representing a deficit of 168 officers as compared to current. And the need demonstrated is primarily in sector patrol. That's based on the workload-based calls for service analysis. But as mentioned, there is also demonstrated need in specialized station assignments. Next slide, please. And this table represents all of the stations in the Golden Gate Division. And you can see here that the deficit as compared to from current and recommended is um, 101 officers. And once again, this is primarily in sector patrol based on the calls for service workload-based analysis, as well as demonstrated need in specialized station assignments, light foot beats, homeless outreach, and housing officers. And then I'm actually going to turn it over to Commander Jones to share her operational perspective. Of course, she was the captain of Ingleside Station prior, and so can provide some more context here on the, the need. Thank you. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that these deficits are as of September 2021. So please note that those deficits are larger now in most of these, uh, for most of these stations. But just operationally, some of the tough decisions we're having to make when I was the captain of Ingleside in the last signup that I had to do, that's essentially shift bidding for our officers where they decide you know, what they want to work, during what time of day, et cetera, um, and if they qualify for specialized assignments, which ones they want to do. Um, I was unable to run a footbeat. I could not run a footbeat because I had to prioritize my officers for sector patrol, and it was the same for the homeless outreach team. I was unable to run that. And unfortunately, we're at a point now where we're making these tough decisions because we have to make sure that we have enough people responding to 911 calls. That is paramount, and everything else, unfortunately, has to take a backseat to that. Even though we know how important it is to you, to the community, how important it is to us, but it's just, a little context for where we are at this point. Thanks, Commander. And then back to the presentation. Great. And next slide, please. And then to touch briefly on some takeaways and themes on the professional staff side. The first major theme is that SFPD has a significant need for professional staff who are trained in analytical, technical, management and policy functions throughout the department. On the analytical side, um, there are many ways in which professional staff are, are critical to our reform efforts. So that is as data reporting requirements increase um, and also as we monitor and implement our ongoing CRI initiative, um, need is identified in teams such as the business analysis team, the crime strategies division, the staff services division, et cetera. And then on the policy side, professional staff do uh, the tasks related to policy, policy issuance in many instances. So this includes things like best practices research, running community working groups, um, writing and issuing policies, and other related tasks. And then on the technology side, of course, technology enables uh, many of, of us to do our jobs. And on the, in the technology division, need is identified uh, across the division, including the project management office, applications, architecture and operations, business intelligence, and also just generalized IT support for the department as well. And then finally, on the management side, there are many units within the department that have either a process-driven component or an office management component. So examples here are the alcohol liaison and permits unit, and then even just a support staff position at the district stations would enable management of the captain staff and could assist with um, tasks such as helping the district station captain prepare for community meetings, um, authoring the newsletter for the station, et cetera, as well. And then the other theme is that SFPD has a need for 
professional staff who possess specialized skill sets. So an example here is criminalists, who we have in our forensic services division, but these individuals are non-sworn, but they are trained in forensic investigation and are able to um, supplement the, department, the p- department's operations with their skill set. And then also in the theme of specialized skill sets are police service aides. And these individuals possess a classification that enables them to undertake administrative tasks that sworn staff might otherwise be tasked with. So this includes things like manning the counter at district stations, um, taking reports on lower priority calls, and other tasks helping out with investigations um, in areas where they're able to. So these also are, are able to benefit our department through their, their classification as well. Next slide, please. And now to get into our staffing levels. So once again, just want to provide a little clarification on that current sworn number I showed prior in comparison to this. So we start with all sworn members in the city. Once again, these numbers that we're looking at are only sworn members in the city. Airport is not included in any of this. And so when we're looking at our, our, all our sworn members, for the current figures I showed prior, we're deducting disability leave and academy recruits. When we're looking at full duty, which is represented on the screen here, we are also deducting individuals who are on temporary modified duty, individuals who are on military leave, individuals who are on family medical leave, et cetera. So a whole other range of less than full duty statuses. And we monitor the citywide full duty number on an ongoing basis because this represents individuals who are fully deployable at that moment. So it's our sort of metric of staffing health that we look at uh, on a continuous basis. And supervisors, I'd just like to add, many of you are familiar with the 1971 target um, that we had prior to Proposition E. And all of full duty staffing was always in comparison to that. So a good reference is right now, our currently, currently our department is at 1612 in comparison to 1971. Obviously the target has changed and the calculation is different a little bit, but I just wanted to provide that information as well because so many people are so familiar with that data set and that metric. And once again, the reason that that current sworn in in the prior table is a little bit different is because, you know, we do have individuals who are working in some temporary modified capacity or who are on more intermittent leaves and might um, be coming back in in a relatively short period of time rather than a longer term leave like DP. But to get to a discussion of our, our citywide full duty staffing, you can see from this chart here that over the last roughly three years, a little over three years since the beginning of January, or the beginning of 2019, January 2019, our citywide full duty staffing has declined from 1868 to 1612. And just over this three year period, this represents a 14% decline. And then one other important point here is that just in the last six months, it ha- citywide full duty staffing has declined by 8%. So from 1747 to 1612. And we'll be going over some of these factors here that contribute to the decline in just a moment. Thank you. (laughs) And this uh, chart provides a breakdown and a visual of our trends in retirements, resignations, and releases. So this is all non-training attrition. So here we're looking at anyone who is separating from the department not for a separation that occurs in academy or FTO. And you can see from the chart that non-training attrition has increased by roughly 80% um, from over the last four fiscal years from FY19 to FY2022. And one very important point here is that FY2022 is of course year to date and we're just entering the last quarter now and we do tend to see retirements spike dramatically sort of at the very end of the fiscal year as well. And then some important takeaways from here just in the breakdown of the uh, separation types. So you can see first and foremost that over the last four fiscal years, retirements are our most prominent category. And this is due 
uh, to department demographics, and this is also a trend that's been observed nationally. So any sworn member that was hired uh, via the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, um, a big sort of national police hiring occurred at that time, and these individuals are reaching retirement age and sort of aging out of the workforce. Um, so that's one component of our separations that are non-training attrition that's occurring. The other is resignations. And so you can see that that's the second biggest category here. And though in fiscal year 2022, due to factors such as the vaccine mandate, we have seen an increase in resignations, the point I want to be clear on here is that this is not a new trend. We really started to see resignations tick up sort of at the end of 2019 and into 2020. And you can see from the chart here that, you know, every, over the last three fiscal years, we have had at least 30 individuals resigning from the department over the fiscal year. And our largest category of resignations is laterals. And we are observing trends in individuals who are, you know, choosing to stay in the profession, but choosing to go elsewhere. So either elsewhere in the Bay Area or leaving the Bay Area and the state entirely. And various factors there, but this is a trend that we have been observing over the last three years, not just over the last six months. So I want to point that out. And then finally, the last point is that our releases are, compared to these other two categories, really negligible. We have had you know, a small uptick in FY 2022 due to the COVID-19 vaccine mandate, but that category is quite small in comparison to our retirements and also our resignations. And next slide, please. And just a little bit more on our, uh, I would say our projection of, of retirements in a way. So this chart here shows that by the end of fiscal year 2022, we will have 518 sworn members who are age 50 or older. And of course, this number will increase every fiscal year thereafter. And then of those, um, of individuals that do possess uh, 20 or more years of service, uh, 382. So it is you know, a, a significant portion of individuals who possess um, definitely age el eligibility and potentially years of service as well. Next slide, please. And then the final piece here is we wanted to provide an update on a project that we're working on to assess the street crisis response teams and priority C calls. So in addition to Proposition E and pursuant to the police commission resolution passed in mid-June of last year, we have engaged with a large scale project with the controller's office to do a couple of things. So first, to determine the ongoing workload uh, attributed to our department that's related to 800 B calls. So of course, priority B calls of a mentally disturbed person. And this is as the street crisis response team continues to be fully staffed and operational. And then we will also be looking at if and how there are specific priority C call types that are currently attributed to SFPD that might be eligible or eligible candidates for transfer to other city agencies. And the specific priority C call types that have been mentioned thus far are homelessness, mental health, and substance use but we are going to be looking at the full universe of priority C calls to determine potential candidates for transfer. And this, once again, will be a large-scale, year-long project with the controller's office, and it will be a workload-based analysis, so we will be able to determine if there is um, potential workload that will be transferred away from SFPD, but at this point we don't know that, and that's what the analysis is going to be looking at. And the last thing I'll say is that we do intend that our project with the controller's office will be repli replicable so that when we conduct future reports per Proposition E, we're able to incorporate the results of this project into our staffing discussions in those reports. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for that very thorough and actually quite frightening report. Um, I, I think that um, it says a lot and the numbers are actually a lot worse than um, I thought, and especially in terms of the non-training attrition um, has increased by 80%. And uh, I am wondering when members leave um, to other agencies, do you have exit interviews to understand why they're leaving? And if we could understand those um, reasons, maybe we can prevent them from leaving. Yes, we do do exit interviews with everybody who is willing, um, and most people are. And what we're hearing in our exit interviews is a lot of times they can go to an agency and make a similar salary where it's closer to home. Um, a lot of times they'll address um, a, a feeling of a lack of support uh, kind of across the board, you know, from the city from you know the department, from the community. Um, they have really touched on a variety of things. Other agencies have better equipment. A lot of these other agencies are very competitive in seeking these candidates out. They're letting people bring their time balances over. Sometimes they're years of service. So there's often really good incentive for them. Hiring bonuses as well, you know, in the thousands and thousands of dollars um, for you know, certain years that they'll stay on. Um, it's very hard to compete with that. Um, so we are capturing the information that they are giving us and trying to come up with solutions and just know that we, we do keep track and we have been keeping track, not just in the last year, but probably back since like 2019 at least, where we started to see this. We have a whole dashboard, <laughs> you know, on where they're going and what they're telling us in their exit interviews. Great, thank, thank you for that. And I, I wanna ask a question too on, it's on page six, the results of the staffing analysis as it relates to the Field Operations Bureau, because I think that's where a lot of um, our involvement as supervisors comes in, in terms of you know, dealing with the station captains and you know, getting to know the footbeat officers and then having them taken away, because of course there's not enough, like you explained. Um, and we know how valuable those footbeat officers have been in the different neighborhoods uh, and uh, this number, the current number um, is 1,263 and that says um, as of September 2021. And based on the other updates in the report, my, my understanding is that number is now possibly below 1,000. Do you have the number as it is today? Because those of course are the officers that are spread throughout the stations and you know when i know there's something going on in the district that needs immediate attention and people are calling my cell phone because they can't get anyone at 911 and i know there's only like two patrol cars out in richmond and they're dealing with other things i have that knowledge it's really hard to explain that to my constituent they just don't understand why don't you have someone to help me and i have to explain we just don't have the officers and they're in, they're in need. And when I look at this number, 1,263, knowing the needs, knowing the demands for service, knowing that it's actually probably worse than even below 1,000, I think it's important for us to understand exactly how many officers we have to go throughout our district stations and whether or not it really is below 1,000. Yes, it's... Yeah. And I can, I can quickly say the, the number that we monitor internally on, on the stations is the number of police officers in the police officer rank at all the stations, and that is well below 1,000 at the moment. And the 1,200 uh, number is everyone. That 1,200 number is everyone, all, all ranks. But then, yes, when we look at, um, since it's our police officer ranks that are responsible for you know, walking a footbeat and for driving around in sector cars, that number is below 1,000. Our current comparable number right now, because once again, this does include everyone in, in FOB, so it does include our sort of centralized FOB as well, but we could get you the station number, is in comparison to that 1263, so exact apples to apples, we are at 1,185. So that is, has been almost an 100 uh, officer decline. Once again, that's all ranks and the entire Field Operations Bureau, but that is as of, as of April 4th, so we have declined across all of the district, district stations since this analysis was conducted. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, we feel it, we hear it, we, we, we get the calls from our constituents and 
um, there's definitely a difference and you and we know that's happening and it's um, we have to do something about it I would be interested to see um, at a later date what the lateral bonuses are for um, in other cities that are pulling away our officers and what are we you know how do we compete with that it's, it would be good to know because I know somewhere it's up to twenty five thousand dollars in some cities so if we can have like a the Bay Area County or even um, California just to get an understanding like what lateral bonuses are other counties doing who's pulling from our department and how can we stop that uh, I think that would be um, good to understand also you know and just want to confirm too um, because a lot of times I hear oh this is they don't need more cops they're just saying this you know and <laughs> we look at you know the methodologies are that are being used approved by the police commission um, you have best practices you have an independent study and I just want to give you a chance to um, speak to the fact that some people um, believe that you don't need what you say you need I think that exactly that, as you just described, the phone calls that you're getting from your constituents and the fact that it's taking us long, a long time to get to some of these calls. I mean, as referenced in the report, our response time for priority C calls was already on the very high end at 61 minutes, and that was as September 20. 21 and now our response times for those priority C calls are and this is in a dashboard maintained by the controller's office are is I think around 99 minutes so that's a significant increase you can see it in the fact that um, sometimes like I said uh, in the Ingle side it really hit home when I couldn't run my Leland Avenue footbeat you know which the community was so desperate for and my officers had such a connection with them and to make that tough decision you know that's directly as a consequence because I don't have enough people handling the calls for service and the calls for service and the workload based methodology is the one thing to direct everybody back to where this is just based on the data of the numbers of calls that come in how long it takes us to handle the call um, and everything else um, is based off that and those levels uh, I think you're going to see it in the fact that we can't staff these assignments consistently um, and we're trying to do our best with what we have available. I think that's where overtime comes in because we're trying to bridge the gap and make sure there's enough people to provide the services that the community expects of us at this point. And that goes far, far beyond the call to call to call to call. Um, so I would argue that with the workload with a workload based methodology for which everything else is based off of. I mean, I think that speaks volumes. Yeah, right. and I, I would just add on the, the priority C calls as well. Matrix Consulting Group, when they conducted our analysis, did the calls for service workload based analysis, but also looked at our response times across priority A, B, and C, and similarly noted uh, priority C response times that they did call sort of abnormally long and they said specifically that this was indicative of a severe resource shortage and that's really because of course officers are going to run from A to B to A to B and clear those higher priority calls off the board and as a result priority C calls do tend to sit for a long time and so just also wanting to replicate what Matrix did we also looked at priority C response times and had the the same finding that these calls are sitting due to the fact that our officers are running from priority, higher priority call to higher priority call. And um, that is, that's one proxy, I would say. And, and what's also concerning to me, and obviously you can't quantify this because this is data evidence, we're basing it on calls for service, is what you know Director Davis said in the other hearing we had on violence against our AAPI community and our um, seniors, is that there is a lot of under-reporting of crime and people that don't call the police because they think the police won't come, which is, a terrible situation to have when people don't feel like you'll be there because priority C calls maybe people wait for hours or nobody comes and people don't understand why that is and I'm hoping this hearing and this evidence-based analysis sheds light on that for people and that people do understand um, why sometimes they don't get the response that they deserve and expect and I know that you want to give uh, so I think, I don't know if my colleagues have questions. I'm assuming they do since Supervisor Mandelman um, showed up. And thank you so much, Supervisor, for being here. And I'll turn it over to you um, before I ask any more questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, Supervisor Mandelman. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Mar and, and uh, Supervisor Stephanie. Um, I was mainly here to listen. I don't have a ton of questions, but, um, but I do have a, a few that have come up. So um, I mean, what we've seen in terms of the numbers of where we are now, and I think it is helpful for me at least, and thank you for sort of putting this into the terms that I understood from before the pandemic and that 1977 number. I think it's just helpful to um, see that we're now by that metric, which I am more familiar with, down um, on our way to going below, uh, below 1,600. Um, and it's also helpful to see how many, you know, the very large number of officers who are now, who are going to be over 50 and we think will be retiring. I assume, and I might have missed a slide, but I assume that there is sort of scenario planning within the department about how that curve, where that curve lands and kind of best case and worst case scenario, if you know things turn around, we're able to recruit, we're able to retain some people. I mean, in any event, this probably gets worse before it gets better, even if, even if we are able to, to do a, a stronger job of recruitment and we keep more of those officers that we're, than we're anticipating now. So the rosy scenario is, I don't know what it is, but it's less than 1,600. Um, and the bad scenarios are probably a lot worse than that, right? Are you running those scenarios? Are you, are you, do we have a sense of what the range looks like or how bad this could get in the next few years? I think that how bad it could get is the fact that take our current staffing level and, and reduce subtract, by 500. Yeah, subtract like in as in 2024, we have 700 people who are retirement eligible. And even though not all 700 would go, that's probably going to balance out with the people who are going to resign in the interim. So I think that that's a good proxy for the fact that you know, we know these people can go, not all of them will, but we also know other people who are able-bodied people are choosing to do this job somewhere else in a different city and trying to account for the balance of that as well. So we can reasonably, so in my head, I have this notion that we lose about 100 officers a year, but we think that in the next couple of years, that might look more like 200 or it could uh -huh. um, and generally the attrition rate that we have given like year over year and kind of our standard is about 80 officers uh -huh. right so I think that it is definitely in the realm of possibility that that could double yeah mm -hmm. so, so and, that oh go ahead <laughs> yeah We're oh all. just just last thing I was going to add is yes we I think in the past to project, we've looked more closely at individuals who are over 50 with 20 years of service, but we are noticing a trend and why we're only looking at sort of over age 50 and over at this point is we are noticing individuals are sort of leaving before they have service eligibility. And that is a trend that we have noticed an uptick in, in just the last couple of years here. So hence why sort of our I would say our age 50 bucket is, is what we're working with on the projection side at the moment. I mean, to I really to max that. out service, <laughs> and for us, you would be age 55 with 30 years of service, and we're seeing we're a seeing trend that our people everywhere. aren't going to 30 years anymore. They really aren't, and really in that 20 to 30 year balance is where a lot of people are making these decisions to retire. So then I am, I'm at, I mean, this is a, <clears throat> I am glad for this hearing, and I think it is important for people to understand that this is a big problem San Francisco is confronting and that we need to respond aggressively to address it. Um, can you talk a little bit about what an aggressive response to this problem looks like and what Absol we need absolutely. to do to attract officers and yes. what the strategies for that are and how we convince some of these 51 year olds that they need to stay a few more years. <laughs> well, of course there's incentives. <laughs> and I think that this is, we have to talk about it in two ways. We have to talk about it in terms of recruitment. So getting people through the door initially to begin a career in law enforcement and or attracting lateral officers from other agencies to come to this city to do law enforcement here. So on the recruitment side, and then on the retention side, maintaining those people with years of service between three and 20 who we have seen the trend who are leaving, 
some things, you know, that people, obviously there's a lot of interest in raises. I will put that, you know, in terms of retention, but there are other retention tools. We're standing up a retention unit within the police department. So that's one of our asks for the budget would be support staffing wise to be able to look at this even more critically and understand all of the dynamics and have robust, you know, answers. We have pretty good answers now, but we want to know everything that we can know to keep people here. Also in terms of retention, you know, looking at things like buying out people's time. Some people have excessive amounts of time because of, you know, because of COVID not being able to go on vacation. So we're looking at vacation time, sick pay, you know, compensation time, all of those things. And these are just ideas that have been, you know, have been floated around the police department. Um, in terms of retention, we're also looking for, you know, maybe having a higher level of training and reimbursements for officers so they are able to get that professional development. Um, and what really, does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, in terms of the training. So right now, currently, the way that that works is there is a bucket of money and it's $5,000 for the entire, like, department of, or the, the POA membership. And that really should be as probably a similar dollar amount, you know, or some variation of per person, you know, um, or to allow, to allow officers to do what? To professionally develop themselves, to keep them reinvigorated, allow them promotional opportunities to see their future here in the police department. You know, let's give them all of their, their tools to be, and I think it's a win-win for the city. You know, we're providing better services because we have better training. And also, you know, they know that they can move up in their career because they have some of the training that they need. Um, I think it's a win uh, on that end. Um, and then some of the other things is, unfortunately, the reality of the situation is we're using a lot of overtime for our officers, and there are caps on that. So perhaps increasing the limits on a more long-term basis, although I don't believe that that's probably the, 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 the solution. It might be a Band-Aid. Um, but those are some of the things that we've looked at on the retention side. I know, Supervisor, you have provided us information on housing supplementation. We have made note of the fact that people do live far distances away, and some are lateraling to be closer to home. We have officers who live in Sacramento, in Tracy, like very long commutes, um, and it's really expensive to buy a house close to the city. So I know your office has looked into that. That would be definitely something that the police department would be interested in exploring. And then on the recruitment side, I think really the, some of the things that we need help with is we're asking for a recruiting firm this year to help us come in. We've always had a local based uh, in the past few years approach to recruitment. We want people from the communities who live here to become officers and work for their communities. We want people with all different kinds of skills. We want the best and the brightest. Um, language skills is one of them and we believe that a firm could help us like really just multiply our workforce and get the name out there and look help us be competitive with these candidates but unfortunately to be competitive with those candidates we need to be competitive salary wise as well so there's um, a proposal of potentially looking at a uh, eliminating some of the salary steps for officers. So traditionally, most classifications in the city have a, a five step and our officers have a seven step. So looking at taking away a step or two um, that would bump up their starting salary by 5,000 plus dollars will help um, perhaps have them come here over one of the other Bay Area agencies. Um, something even, I mean, it seems trite, but it costs $55 to take our written test to get into the department. It would be great if we could waive that fee for all applicants so that there wasn't that impediment. We see a huge drop off in our hiring process from the initial application to the actual taking of the written test, which is the next step. And we lose a ton of candidates there. We've had a really robust recruitment effort where we follow up with them, we call them, we text them, do you need help? Um, but I think that that could help us. If they didn't have to pay for it and they could just take it, then at least they'll entertain the idea of doing this a little longer if it was a little easier. And how, how much did you say that test was? I'm sorry. It's, I think it's around $55. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, um, but I'll double check, supervisor, I have to check. <laughs> um, and then of course, 
bonuses for, for incoming recruits, people who want to start here. So, and that could be tiered by how many years they stay. So if it's you know, $5,000, $10,000 a year for a certain period of years with us, I mean, it's more years than we would have gotten without them. Um, and similarly, we need to be competitive with the laterals. And supervisor, I can provide you the research that we've done with laterals. I actually have a, 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 something I can hand you at the end of this meeting. And, and I assume you have built some of this into the, into the budget proposal that you've submitted to the yes. mayor for this year. Um, just on the, on the sort <laughs> of, on, and to underscore, I, mean, I think people know this, but to underscore the dire recruitment situation, um, you're running, the academy classes that we are running are running at half capacity or less than half Correct. capacity, or quarter capacity in the case of the, the class that most recently graduated, I Correct. think. Correct. Right? So 13, 12 instead of 50, um, at least is what, what's getting graduated. On, in terms of the, you know, the how, I, I do, I am interested. I know it's hard for a department to take on, um, you know, real estate as a project, um, but I do wonder um, if particularly for younger officers, maybe not, you know, folks are 15 years in, but for people who are either thinking about joining the department, um, well, people who are thinking about joining the department, if the ability to live in a reasonably priced um, unit uh, in San Francisco could be an incentive. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot through the pandemic in our response to homelessness and the ability to rapidly buy up buildings um, that, and, and not be on a, you know, a five-year development framework, but on a, you know, a year-long acquisition and rehabilitation kind of path. And if that might be something um, that we could look at for you know officers and, the fir and their families and you know the first few years at least of service and um, you know pairing that maybe with some other public employees we have a problem citywide in attracting um, and retaining folks and I think um, you know having having some nice buildings or, or um, uh, complexes where where public employees might be able to live would be a, an interesting approach, which, you know, as I've said, we're interested in. And there's other, lots of other cities have done many different kinds of things around housing. So I, I'm hoping we can look at that. Um, you touched on the equipment problem. I feel like this gets short shrift um, all around. And yet when I talk to officers who are actually doing the work, they lament the state of their equipment. And it underscores, I think, for them the, the, the question mark about whether they are in fact valued. So can you talk a little bit about equipment? Yes, so we've had people say in exit interviews, like, and it's usually, and I wanna be clear, when they're exiting, it's multiple factors, you know, they'll combine them together, but we have heard people say, you know, I'm getting paid about the same, you know, and I get, like, I get to drive a really nice car, like a, a car that looks good. And there's, there's equipment. I have a, you know, a stipend for how much, you know, you know, can be allotted to me for certain specialized tools, et cetera. So we have, ha we have had people say that specifically. Um, I also think there's just a morale component of driving in a car that looks nice and isn't, you know, many, many, many years old. Our, our cars, older than you are. Yeah, older than me, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, in some cases. Yes. Uh, but ones that, you know, our, our cars get driven 24 seven and I think that that's something that we forget. Like they're really in service all the time and people would like their cars to function well, be able to serve them. And I, I do think it's, it, it is helpful. I wanna um, just commend you for looking to, uh, for, for hiring, um, a recruiter and looking beyond San Francisco. I think, you know, classically, um, you know, the, the main source of recruits has been kids who grew up in San Francisco who might have family who had, who had been in the department. And um, I actually experienced that with a, a couple of officers on a ride along a few, you know, a few weeks back. Um, but I think increasingly work, working class, as the, real, the sad reality is that increasingly working class and particularly working class people of color um, are, are getting priced out of San Francisco. And if we want to have um, a police department that looks like San Francisco and especially looks like communities that are experiencing higher levels of policing, we may need to re recruit beyond San Francisco. And I think, you know, there is a national pitch to be made that this is a path-breaking, um, groundbreaking, 
history-making department that is doing cool things. And if we can give you a, a compensation package and uh, maybe even a, a place to land in terms of housing for the few, first few years that you're here, maybe it's worth making the move and being part of um, shaping what you know policing looks like in the 21st century. So I'm hoping we can do that. I'm hoping it's a successful effort. And I want to thank you um, for your efforts, even though I miss you in Ingleside. Yeah, I miss you too. <laughs> thank you. Supervisor Haney. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Marr, and uh, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, and thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for, for calling the hearing. Uh, it's, this is obviously uh, very concerning, and it's a, it's a problem that is only going to get worse based on those projections that we see there. Uh, some of the questions that I had were, were similar to uh, Supervisor Mendelman's, but I had a few others. Um, one is uh, around uh, salary. How, how does uh, the salaries that we offer, either for starting or, or uh, you know, throughout the steps, compare to other Bay Area departments? I think that um, there are definitely Bay Area departments that pay more than we do. I think, and Patrick, I think you may be able to speak to this. He's in charge of the money. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Haney. So we did look through a, um, a, a survey of all of the different police departments within the Bay Area, and in comparison to some of the other municipalities, the San Francisco is actually on average or on the lower end of the scale. Part of it is the, the starting pay of the officers and what we had, one of the recommendations that um, Commander Jones had, had suggested was to eliminate the starting two steps of uh, the, cute, the police officer salary for any new recruits coming in. And at least with that, it would bring us more along, more in parity with what some of the other jurisdictions have been offering uh, to their new recruits. Got it, thank you. Uh, and uh, are, are we, you mentioned different bonuses and those sort of things, are we offering anything like that for, for our department? Currently, there are some bonuses that are identified within the, uh, the Police Officer Association MOU agreement with the city and county, however, the, uh, the amounts are below what other jurisdictions have been offering. I, I, I think I, we're I, offering 2,000. Something like, like that. Like around 2,000. And some of these other agencies are offering 10,000, 20,000, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, when you say that, 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 that I, I saw the, the numbers in the report around, you know, average of about 80 officers that are either retiring or moving to another department or being released. Is, is that, what is the net loss? So I, I'd imagine that we are hiring as well and some laterals are coming to San Francisco and some are coming to the academy. What, what is the actual net? Um, so in years past, we have been able to net bodies, supervisor. So meaning that we hire, hire, are hiring more people than we are losing. But just for context, last year in 2021, we hired 41 people. And we lost far more than 41 people last year. And that 41 is just individuals entering the academy. The first phase doesn't include academy attrition or FDO attrition yeah. or through probation. And that's in comparison to 2015 when we had 265 people who we hired on the front end and we didn't lose 265 people. So if that makes sense. So we're netting, we're not netting anything right now in so, this moment. We're losing consistently. So just so, so I'm clear on what you're saying there. So in past years, we were able to make up for, it would be helpful to, to see this in, in a graph in future um, presentations because it seems like an important aspect of this because of course the, the loss of officers each year is, is, is uh, a concern and notable, although there's some loss of officers that happens every year because of retirements and other um, you know, lateral movements, but if we are uh, uh, backfilling those with lateral hires of our own or or, right. uh, or, or, or new recruits, then 
it's it's keeping yeah. steady. So that but it sounds like that was happening for years, and then just this past year or this current year, we we had a huge drop off. I may, maybe it's in the report. It wasn't. In yeah, we, we the had it. Well, I, I can speak no, to this a little bit. Yes. Yeah, we did have a huge drop off for sure in 2021, but we were realizing ever since 2015, 2016, were both big hiring years, roughly around 250 new recruits entering the academy. Um, I think we ran five or six classes of about 50. But since then, so pretty much 2017, but 2018 onward, we have seen sort of a smaller number of, so fewer classes and smaller classes uh, pretty much over the last five years, culminating with 2021, where we Yes, did hire 41 individuals. So we hired 41 individuals, but we lost probably closer to 100 plus, meaning that that brought us down 60 officers below what we were. So in order for us to maintain our staffing levels, we have to hire the same number that we are going to lose. And in order to grow, we have to hire even more. If I may just add, There's a graph within the presentation that shows the full duty staffing. That does represent kind of that, um, the the combination of how many people we've been able to hire versus how many people have been leaving. Uh, It was that slide that showed we were down to 16, 16, 16, 12. This slide was 16, 12 on its supervisor. So you can see that we're like sort of hovering like, you know, fairly flat and then we start to dip. So, but yeah, and I think, thanks Patrick for bringing it up. I think the key point is like, this has been a steady decline over the last three years. Like we have just like, you know, aside from the last six months, there hasn't been any sort of precipitous dips, but it has been going down and it has not gone up. It's just a very sort of steady, even keel. And supervisor, that's a, a great question. I think that is because we are, we are losing people and we are not netting them back with a volume of individuals entering the department. So, and Supervisor Manaman brought this up when we are, uh, you know, funding uh, new new classes, uh, and we're not able to fill those classes in, in some cases. Um, h- how do we think about addressing that moving forward? Because if we if we've said, all right, we're going to f- uh, fund, you know, five classes next year, but we can't. Uh, fill those classes, Correct. then uh, w- what's the right balance there? Is the, is-, is the issue that we're not funding enough classes or there's something that's happening in our ability to bring in recruits into those classes even when we, f- when we fund them? And certainly the, to get to where you want to get to in the report in terms of staffing, uh, I, you know, a- along the lines of Supervisor Mandelman, I I'm not exactly clear how what the recommendations were to get there if we are not able to fill even the classes that are, uh, it sounds like, too, too small to begin with. Right. So, so that, yeah, that would absolutely be step one, would be to fill the classes. And we have um, asked for support uh, this year. I mentioned the recruiting firm already. There's also some technology that we're looking to procure that's going to help us make contact with these applicants, keep track where our successes are, where we're really getting bang for our buck, essentially, um, and additional staff on the professional staff side to support our recruitment efforts. Um, and then, obviously, the incentive component as well, attracting people to this city, to the San Francisco Police Department, because we are competitive and you know it, they wouldn't you know if they're auditioning several agencies that sometimes at the end of it is usually it's one or two factors one whoever hires them first or two however money much money they mm-hmm. they're offering to start and what the incentives are so that would be our proposal would be the support for the recruitment tools mm-hmm. um, but also the support for incentives that would get people here mm-hmm. and if I'm, if i may just add to that Part of what makes it difficult is our overall budget. If you look at two years ago during the budget process, our overtime was cut 25% in the first uh, budget year and then another 25% the following year. And even up to this point, we still haven't recovered from that. If you look at where our overtime spending has been, we've had to 
We'd, we've had to rely upon overtime to backfill for vacancies that exist. And as a consequence of that, when we run into an overtime deficit, what that translates to within the academy classes, and even a lot of our hiring is that we have to either suspend or delay um, hiring, and that includes academy classes. So to, to just to, to reiterate that point, if we run into a deficit within our overtime, what that will translate to is we're, we're going to have to balance, rebalance our budget in other ways, and one of the only options that we have is to either delay the academy classes or uh, to suspend other hiring. And right. if it runs to that point where a candidate can either choose to uh, join the police department, San Francisco Police Department, but they have to wait two months for the academy class to start versus joining another jurisdiction where their, their academy starts next week, they're, they're just not going to wait for us. Right. Got it. No, that, that's, that's helpful. And, you know, certainly uh, it's both having the adequate and ongoing uh, academy classes and then having the tools to recruit and fill those and then retain folks while they're, they're, they're with us. Uh, and, uh, again, w one of the things that uh, unfortunately is unique about San Francisco, among many things, is how expensive it is to live here and to have housing here. So obviously that's a big concern, I'm sure, uh, to be able to deal with making sure we build enough housing and have access to work, workforce housing. Uh, and it seems like uh, uh, in, in, in the interim, while we are doing that, we also uh, are going to want to put investments into recruiting uh, people who are here in San Francisco or from San Francisco or have roots here I'd imagine, and, and I, I don't know if this has been studied uh, closely, but I'd imagine that there's probably um, stronger rates of retention there. Certainly, when I was at the school district, that was something we looked a lot at, and we saw those same patterns. It's just much harder for people who are coming to us from further away to uh, uh, stay um, and, and to have a sustainable career uh, if, if, if they're driving for a few hours or, or don't otherwise have roots in the city. So I, I, I would also hope that as part of these recruitment plans that we're really both investing in those efforts but also making them, uh, really tracking them uh, for their effectiveness and their results. You know, sometimes you can say things like, oh, we're, we're sending people to go speak at high schools or, you know, right. but we need real deep pipelines from for folks who are here. In fact, you know, as I'm sure this is happening, but people who are otherwise demonstrating in, in interest in public safety, right? Maybe somebody's going and taking some courses at City College that's demonstrating that their interest in public service or safety. And, and those are the folks that we really want to support with that mentorship and, and, and guidance to get into to this career. So th th those are some of the things that, that I would... Um, want to underscore. I do want to give you an opportunity, and this is my, my last question. Uh, this is something that comes up sometimes, particularly uh, in my district and in the, in, in the Tenderloin more recently, uh, and I just want to give an opportunity for, for folks to address it. Uh, people, people were very aware of the deployment that took place in Union Square and uh, the, the sort of, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways, a uh, uh, an unprecedented, uh, though, though temporary, uh, show of force in, in some ways. And that has stuck in a lot of people's minds in, in the way that they understand uh, our staffing and deployment capacity. And, uh, you know, uh, some folks will say, well, you know, they clearly have the, the officers. Why, why can't they just deploy them in a different way or bring them to areas of need like the Tenderloin or, or otherwise? And so I'm wondering, you know, how, how you respond to it and explain that in this context, because it's, it definitely uh, is something that comes up with the public or residents. And I, I want to just give an opportunity to, 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 to understand how something like that is possible. Clearly dozens and dozens and dozens of officers deployed in one area for some amount of time. Um, and, and, and how you kind of understand those types of deployments within the context of our staffing needs. Well, good afternoon, Supervisors. Deputy Chief David Lazar, oversee the Field Operations Bureau. I first want to start out by thanking you very much for having today's hearing. Thank you, 
Supervisor Stephanie for your uh, leadership and initiative on this and thank you to all of you for your comments today. In our opinion, this is one of the most important uh, topics we believe going on in the city right now is having adequate public safety and making sure that there are enough officers to make, to make sure everyone's safe. So first I'd like to start out with you, Supervisor Haney. So as you know, on November 19th, we had a big incident occur at Louis Vuitton, uh, organized robbery that took place at several stores, including that store. And really we had been thinking for a long time about how our Union Square, uh, unlike Times Square in New York City, was really understaffed with basically two, at, at best, four officers patrolling a large area, huge influx of, influx of tourists, a um, lot of things happening, a lot of retail crime, organized retail crime. So based on the leadership of our mayor, our chief, and our department, we moved forward quickly to, to deploy officers to that area, as you know. That was a big lift for our department. Uh, not only monetarily was that a big lift, but one of the one of the topics that were, were, the underlying topic that we're talking about today is really our workforce. And it was a big lift for our workforce because it was all on overtime. We were canceling people's days off. We were holding them over later. Um, it was a tremendous lift. And we recognized early that it was such a big lift that we needed to cut back. And we've cut back since then. As time has developed, we then realized that we had to, to employ the same model in the Tenderloin. And as you know, Supervisor, we've increased staffing. I know we've been public about the numbers. We've had 20 additional officers. It's actually 24 additional officers in the daytime and into the evening. And we've all, that complements the existing anywhere between eight and 12 officers assigned to footbeats in the Tenderloin as it is. So that is also a big lift for our department. We are canceling days off. I think the answer to the constituents is, is that we don't have the, that staffing. Um, we're spending a lot of money on that staff. It's hard to sustain in terms of officers having their days off cancels, cancel, which affects them, it affects their families, it affects their personal lives. Um, and we see the need to make sure that we have adequate staffing in the Tenderloin so that the residents, the population, everyone there feels safe and that we're addressing uh, the things that are going on there. So I hope that answers your question. We have to do it, we need to do it, uh, but there is a cost associated with doing it, uh, both monetarily and also as it adversely affects our wor workforce. Thank you, Th that is helpful and, and uh, it's important you know, to, to understand the, the ways in which it's unsustainable and it's costly, certainly it uh, uh, places strains and I'm, I'm sure that the, as I looked at the other stations and the needs that, 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 that are, are there across the, the city, it puts some strains on that as well. Uh, I, you know, we have seen the difference in the Tenderloin over the past few weeks, and, and thank, thank you for that, particularly uh, a level of staffing that allows for, for some more footbeats and even um, you know, um, fixed posts, which I think in the Tenderloin is sort of unique in, in that regard in terms of some of the really challenging areas. Uh, so uh, certainly this is, this is a, a, um, a huge area where we're going to need to uh, provide support and leadership and innovation, you know, to meet these challenges. And, uh, and thank you for, for your leadership and thank you again, colleagues, for, for your focus on, on this really important issue to protect all of our, our, our residents, uh, small businesses and visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Haney. Um, Supervisor Stephanie, before I turn it back to you, I, d I did have a few comments and questions of my own. And um, you know, first of all, thank thanks again, uh, Commander Jones and everyone for this presentation, this, this really important discussion uh, with us today about um, how we can ensure that that we have adequate staffing in our police department and um, to, to uh, address the public safety concerns of, of all of our neighborhoods. And um, in, and it's really helpful to have the updated staff analysis. So thanks for your work on that, Celeste and others. And just, it's not surprising to see that the the recommended um, staffing, you know, across the um, sworn and and um, and also the the civilian positions across the bureau is, is pretty similar to what the, what was recommended in the 2020 uh, matrix study. I see the response. Uh, but you, said five you know, the minutes, significant about... I think Sorry. issue. You know, from the report and, and this discussion is, is 
the um, the increase in in um, in resignations, you know, retirements and, and lateral transfers, and and also it's very concerning to you know that you you highlighted that that's potentially going to increase significantly, particularly the retirements, given you know the large number of our sworn officers um, at at who are at that age, and um, and then I think the discussion has really highlighted that um, one of the not the only, but certainly the, the key um, reason for this, that we're in this situation with, with such a deficit um, and growing significantly of, of our um, police force is, is the lack of um, a strategic and a comprehensive retention and recruitment plan for, for the department. And um, so I appreciate you know, all the different new ideas that, that you've mentioned today, um, Commander Jones, and, and about retention and, and recruitment. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's really good to see that this is a top priority for the department, and it certainly, I think, for my colleagues and I, and, you know, in the city, is to, to be able to retain and, and, and recruit um, new officers to, to fill these positions. And I, I was at the, the last um, ac police academy graduation ceremony at the Scottish Rite Temple. Supervisor Mandelman was there as well. And again, I was surprised and, and a bit shocked to see only 12, I think 12 graduates at that academy. And, um, and I think this, the presentation and discussion today kind of put that experience in, in, into a broader context about the, the staffing challenges in the department. Um, I, just to understand it a little bit better, the recruitment challenges, can you talk through um, like how we ended up with just 12 in, in that graduating, the last graduating class? Because uh, you've mentioned like even on the statistics on hires, you, you claim it's not just graduation, but it's somebody that just starts the academy is, is considered a already hired? They're considered hired, but they're not considered deployable for our numbers. So that they will never be included in that 16, 12 count or you know, because they haven't made it through the training program. So a lot of it, supervisor, is that our, a lot of our candidates are not making it through the training program as well. You know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot less interest in the profession as a whole. Um, so the people that were typically applying to be police officers are not play, applying in the same droves that they were before. Um, that's where we're really hoping to leverage the recruiting firm is to get those people in who are also going to be successful through the process because as you've seen, not all of our recruits are. And that's also why we wanna really focus on lateral officers because our lateral officers have already been in law enforcement and virtually all of them will pass through the supplemental training that they have to do through SFPD. And in some cases, when they come out of state, they have to do training to become certified in the state of California. But traditionally they're successful in that and we get a big return on our investment. But you see the, the numbers decline because that class, I don't know exactly how many that class started with, but typically what we've been seeing is 20 to 25 and eight people didn't pass. So. Yeah, and just to add to there, I think you know we, we will always see training and attrition, but I think the academy has been sort of targeting those specific areas where individuals are failing to pass. And I think there are several areas where we do offer sort of training above and beyond uh, the post requirements and also specifically remediation in those areas where candidates, you know, for example, emergency driving um, might be falling short as well. So we are looking at that data to sort of combat some of the, the training attrition, but we are seeing that at the moment. And, you know, that, that will always be sort of a reality, but we're, we're deploying strategies to, to mitigate some of that. And the training is, like in that case of our emergency vehicle operations course, a lot of people aren't driving like they used to anymore because we have Uber yeah. and those things. But our academy staff is doing twice the required number of hours to get people up to speed because we want every single person to pass. And they're really making huge investments on mentorship, you know, bridging the gap where people in areas where people may be deficient to get them to get them to be able to meet the standards that are required for this job. Um, and that's also to speak on the front end as well. We do a ton of mentorship to get people in, to help them practice for the physical requirements for this job, to help them practice the written test, the oral interview, you know, to make sure that 
none of the impediments, you know, we're trying to put people on equal footing, but, you know, if things, there are deficiencies that we're trying to close the gap there. Um, and that really speaks, I think, to diversity and equity as well. You know, we look at that through the lens. Um, we're examining all of our failure rates in those areas as well and making sure that there is equity for all candidates. Thank you. And um, how many, and, and then what's, what's the current plan for, for new, uh, the next academy or new academies this year? So we have an academy class that's um, supposed to start in June. So we will put as many people into it, supervisor, as we can get qualified candidates. Um, our hiring process is always ongoing. So um, hopefully we will get up to similar levels of where we've been for the past few, which is around 25. Obviously that's not ideal state for us. An ideal academy is 50 plus, but that's just reality at this moment. Um, there will be one then, and then whatever academies are to come as a result of the budget. I, I will tell you right now, realistically, in a fiscal year, we can hire about 100 to 120 people. And I think one thing that we haven't spoken about is that this gap is not going to be closed in this year. This is going to be a multi-year hiring plan, um, an investment probably beyond five years to make sure that we have enough people. Right. And you mentioned, so the department has the capacity to, to hire 100 to 120, did you say 20 people per year, new, new recruits per year? What, what's the constraint on, on that? Or what? We have the capacity to hire more supervisors, okay. like meaning to train more. So okay. it's really the interested applicants. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the interest in it, not so much the capacity to train. We don't, we will be able to meet, you know, hopefully, you know, whatever the burden for whatever um, we would need to do in a year. But just realistically, given the rates that people are applying, I mean, I think it's really important to note that we went from th almost 3,000 applications in 2018 to just over, I, I think, just around 1,100 in 2021. So that's a huge decline in the number of people applying on the front end. So obviously, if we were to get droves and droves of people in, then we might need, we will need additional staff to train them, but we're already operating at half capacity. We used to run academy classes to the tune of 50 plus people and multiple academy classes a year. Um, is that drop off that you mentioned in, in the applicants that it sounds like it might have dropped from 3,000 to 1,000? Um, yes. Is that unique to San Francisco, or is that something that, that departments are seeing in other cities? I think it's a nationwide trend of applicants dropping off. Again, it's related to interest in the profession. Yeah. Um, however, I'm not sure. We would have to look and see if our rates are exacerbated to any extent in this city, but it, it's not an, something anomalous to just San Francisco. Yeah, and I think, yeah, anecdotally, that's exactly what I'd say, sort of nationwide trend, but potentially exacerbated in San Francisco, given the high cost of living, the strong job market in the Bay Area and the region specifically as well as sort of what mm -hmm. we've observed. Great, and then I, I also just had a question around the, the methodology for the, um, the staff analysis and that the, the, the sort of um, the workload based methodology and you show that sort of target or ideal yeah. breakdown in the three buckets between the responding to the calls for service being 35 to 45 percent and and then the community community engagement uh, time mm -hmm. at 30 percent and then admin time is a rest so um, you know I think certainly for my constituents um, our, our neighborhood businesses and residents we'd really like to see a lot more focus on the community engagement work, the proactive um, activities like foot, foot patrols and, and community engagement to, to really prevent crime. And um, so I understand that this is an ideal sort of percentage breakdown. Um, and what I was wondering if you could speak to what, what do you think it's been in recent years? Um, it sounds like given the, 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 the deficit in, in sworn staff, it, most of the time spent re responding to calls for service and, and a lot less on the community engagement, proactive crime prevention activities. Can you speak to roughly like what percentage it's been? 
Yeah, roughly. So this is sort of across all district stations and in the year that we did, but hovering around, and once again, varies by station, but around 20% and in some instances lower. And that's largely due to the fact that officers are spending, you know, approximately 45, 50, above 50, and, you know, certain times a day and days of week uh, responding to calls for service. So it has been uh, roughly around 20% uh, or or in many instances a bit lower on that community engagement proactive policing side right now. So we are mm -hmm. off of the ideal state right now. And supervisor, that's also exacerbated by additional administrative duties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have we have body-worn camera footage that needs to be downloaded. We have reports to write. We have a new supervisory um, use of force policy that's going to expand. Um, so admin time, expand the um, amount of time spent on administrative mm -hmm. activities, training, um, all of those things contribute as well um, to collapsing that bucket for the community engagement time to a smaller number. Yeah, and one, one additional thing I'll say on the administrative time is the controller's office did a sector patrol analysis, exact same methodology in 2018, and looked at the three years prior, but really found that of sort of all of the buckets, it was actually administrative time that was increasing the most dramatically over the, the three-year time period that they looked at. And, you know, that's, that's, that trend is very much still uh, present today as well. We do know that administrative time is increasing due to additional requirements and, of course, absolutely necessary things, but needs to be factored in to the time that, that officers have to devote to all of their various activities as well. Thank you. And just one last question on the responding to calls for service um, and, and, you know, uh, that the importance of that and trying to get to the, the target sort of response time um, that for, for the different types of calls, I think that that's extremely important. And, uh, but as that relates to the, the, the street crisis response teams and, and sort of our, this, our move to create these alternative um, responses to calls for service for behavioral health and homeless calls that seem to occupy a lot of the up till recently, a lot, a lot of the time of our sworn officers in responding to, you know, that obviously was um, this new approach that we're just, it's still rolling out, a work in progress was intended to, to see if that could be a better, more effective way to respond to these types of calls than just having sworn officers do it, but instead having trained um, health professionals and, and community paramedics do it. Uh, but it was also done, I think, as a way to think how we could, as a way to try to free up you know, our, the, the, the precious yes. time for our <laughs> officers so they could, yeah, yeah particularly do the, the, the proactive um, community engagement activities, at least that's what I w was hoping to see. So I know, Celeste, you said that there's going to be analysis of that yeah. and, and the shift to the street crisis response team and the other street response teams and how that could lead to a reduction in, yeah, in, in sworn officer time devoted to those. Um, and you're working with the controller's the, office on this analysis? Or? We are, yeah, and we've, we've worked with them on numerous projects before, so they're very familiar with our data, but I think, Supervisor Mar, that you hit it right on the head, I think we really are trying to sort of, of course, look for agencies that might be appropriate to handle, but also free up some of this, because we don't have the, sort of be creative in all of our, stra our strategies, given our current staffing. And so, yes, the project that we embark on with the controller's office will be, I think it's 1,500 hours, so it's a, it's a large-scale project, but we will intend to do something that's workload-based, so it will actually sort of translate on the SCRT side to, to an, a potential number of staff. And, you know, of course, SCRT has been, been getting up and running the last couple of years, so now we feel like hopefully there will be a volume of data that we'll be able to analyze in order to... To generate some numbers and then on the priority C side we intend to look through the entire universe of priority C calls and then what we'll work with them to do is identify just potential candidates and then potential um, other city agencies so this will be a little bit more on the sort of recommendation side given a survey of the priority C data. So those are the two components of the analysis. Commander, I don't know if you have something yeah, to add just, there. Um, just with the workload supervisor related to the priority C calls, it's, it is hope, hopefully will equate to a number of people where if this the burden of this workload was mm -hmm. alleviated from the police department, it would free up X number, you know, which would 
then you know help fix the deficit a little bit because we wouldn't need so many people to do those things. Um, but again, we're very much in the infant stages of this. We won't know until the controller does their analysis of all our call types and we figure out what is feasible to have another agency take responsibility for and then what the equation would be in terms of staffing for SFPD. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, that, that's very important work for, for a lot of reasons, including um, looking at how it could help address the staff deficit in the department. So thank you. Supervisor Stephanie. Thank you, Chair Maher, and thank you to my colleagues for your extremely important questions. A lot of them were mine, so um, I obviously won't go over those. And I, you know, I want to say too, obviously, um, there's a trend nationwide in terms of um, the career of um, policing. And I do think it's fair to say, though, in San Francisco, the political climate here contributes to morale problems and whether or not people want to stay here or come here. And I think that has to be said. I also want to talk about how um, this relates, this lack of police staffing and what the situation we're facing affects the people in San Francisco. And those are field questions I think I have for uh, Deputy Chief Lazar. But, you know, in that context, you know, just yesterday or the day before, uh, you know, someone in the marina report allegedly was stabbed um, just for her wedding ring. I mean, these are these are reports that are common um, on almost every day. And when you look at who are the victims of crime in San Francisco in 2021, people of color were victims in 71 percent of the aggregated assaults, 67 percent of batteries, 82 percent of robberies, 39 percent of burglaries, 83 percent of homicides and 64 percent of sexual assaults. And then we also have domestic violence, which of course you all know is one of the most dangerous calls that you all go on. And during the pandemic, calls to 911 increased by 40%, calls to our cooperative restraining order uh, clinic increased by 166%. And those seeking emergency shelter during that time were turned away at the rate of 79%. Lack of police staffing has a severe impact on the lives of San Franciscans. And I think it's important for you to tell us what that looks like. And when we're talking about field, you know, we talked about that number and how it's even lower, how it's probably even below 1,000 for the officers we have spread throughout those 10 stations. I would like to know, uh, Deputy Chief Lazar, um, how, what, what are the consequences in the field and what remain the most significant public safety challenges because of this lack of staffing? Well, thank you, Supervisor, for the question, and you've been spot on, on in terms of all the perspective that you have and how uh, challenging this is. You know, in my 30 years in the police department, I haven't seen it to the point that it is right now, and I'm really grateful that we in city government are taking a proactive role. I want to step back up for a moment and just um, add to what you've said. You know, we've had challenges in the policing profession across this country in the last two years, and we're grateful that we have been on the forefront in reform and moving this organization forward and as you mentioned voluntarily agreeing to moving forward on 272 recommendations at this point in 2022 i think it's important that we in city government and and the citizens and the community in san francisco rally around and support our officers and really do everything we can to make them feel supported and do everything we can to retain them um, because as we, we can talk the numbers all day long, it's, it's not going to get better. In June, there'll be quite a few people leaving, and by the holidays, it'll be the same, and then who knows what it'll look like next year. So thank you very much for that. The other thing I'd like to mention really quick, Supervisor, before I get right to the question, is that one of the questions you posed was um, the folks in this city that say, well, we don't need more officers, like there's no reason. Well, two things. One is, if, if this isn't evidence-based today, I'm not sure what is. And secondly, just ask your constituents, how do they feel? Do they feel safer? Do they feel safer in the last year? Um, do they feel safer in the last few months? And I, I would say that they probably don't. And, I, and I'm gonna say that's directly related to not seeing footbeat officers and bicycle officers and engaging in community policing activities and community engagement activities and also waiting for the police to come one or two or three days for a burglary report and all those things you've mentioned. And yes, we do have a tremendous amount of underreporting, we believe, because people feel like, well, why bother? It takes the police a while to get there or we never heard anything about what happened, et cetera. Um, so 
so I say that to say that um, this staffing is, this is, there's a tremendous impact on public safety in our city to get to your main question uh, with regard to not having enough officers to do the work. And you had said about having two or three uh, patrol cars on the midnight shift patrolling, that is completely unacceptable. Um, we have to make sure that we're fully staffed up. Most district stations have between, well, anywhere is between four and six patrol sectors that they're responsible for overnight. We have to staff all those sectors to make sure that we get to the calls and we get there quickly in the middle of the night when emergencies occur and all throughout the day. So I think for all the reasons we've been talking about, um, this is why we need to act on the fact that we don't have enough staff to do the work that we need to do in 2022 and we can already predict uh, what the future may hold with, with that regard. Thank you for that. And I also want to touch on um, gun violence and shootings because obviously I've done a lot of work on gun violence prevention and we know that gun violence and shootings are not actually considered as part of the crime rate and in our, um, to evaluate that. But we know that shootings are up and um, this, I think the public certainly perceives gun violence as crime and something that makes them feel unsafe. And uh, reports certainly, of course, of gun violence require a police response, one would think. And I am wondering what is happening in the field um, when it comes to gun violence and how has this shortage um, impacted that? Because uh, we know that like, it's increased at um, rates that I haven't seen since I've lived here. Yeah, I think there's two areas. It's, it's what are we doing in patrol as far as my bureau, Field Operations Bureau, and then how proactive are we being in the investigations bureau? And I know we have acting deputy chief Viswani here, uh, which is a whole other topic we haven't been talking. Staffing shortages affect the entire organization. It affects investigations and special operations. We have deputy chief Perea here as well. But with regard to gun violence, one of, there's two big strategies that we've been um, moving forward on as of late. One, the investigations bureau can talk about all their great proactive work with their community violence response team. Um, our work with the California partnerships with, with our consultant on really narrowing down on shooting reviews and really focusing on those that may be future shooters or future victims and doing a big intervention piece on that. That is really a national best practice that we have just embarked on. But in terms of patrol on the day-to-day -day operation, we have been uh, having officers work on an overtime basis because of staffing to be highly visible in some of the corridors and areas where we believe shootings may occur so that we have a visible presence so that we can prevent the next shooting. I feel, I believe, based on my experience and what I've seen, that we've been successful doing that. But again, it's a heavy lift when you don't have enough officers to make sure that they're out in the areas and the corridors and the portions of the city preventing the violence and the shooting from taking place. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous, um, burden on the workforce and, and on the officers. They have been great. They have done it. They've done a great job. I feel like we would have had much more had they not done that. But again, there's, it's a, there's a cost associated with that. Thank you for that. And also Supervisor Haney did ask a question that I had around, of course, our open air drug markets and um, how that is um, impacting the San Francisco Police Department and staffing and arrests. Um, so I, I, I don't think I need to go into that any further unless you want to add anything. But um, I also want to talk about how reoffense rates, because we hear over and over again of drug dealers, um, just like it's a catch and release program where they are, you know, if you make an arrest, how much does it even matter at this point, it seems anyway, to the public. And so I would like to talk about how reoffense rates and length of det detention impact your work your field work, and what are you experiencing regarding the frequency with which offenders are rearrested, and, and again, how is that affecting your work in the field? I'll turn it over to Acting Deputy Chief Faswani from Investigations, who oversees our narcotics unit and can speak to clearance rates and investigations. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Supervisors, for this very important subject, and I want to thank also the community that is watching this and, and their interest is really important to us for public safety. For narcotics, the way staffing has impacted narcotics is we're down to about uh, one lieutenant, three sergeants in narcotics. 
we do borrow a team from um, operations and we do have an enforcement team of 12 officers that assist us in these um, street level narcotics operations. We also really value the arrests that patrol makes when they have a chance for narcotics and we sometimes adopt those cases and are able to work them up. They're very resource intensive. Many of these cases require um, multiple search warrants, surveillance, um, could take weeks and weeks just for a crew of drug dealers. The drug dealers in the Tenderloin, as you know, are in the hundreds. Um, the ones that we do arrest, we do petition the court to try to get stay away orders from. We see a lot of repeat offenders. Um, and, you know, again, and that's just, um, just what the narcotics detail does. And they do about two operations a week. We're kind of tapped at that level for various reasons, but that's pretty much what our commitment is. And we've been able to keep that commitment. Thank you for that. Um, and I know the public has been waiting and um, I want to turn to public comment. I, and I just want to also mention too that um, we have, I've had three pedestrian deaths in um, District 2 and one was because a, a woman ran um, a red light and a teacher was killed at Sherman Elementary. And I know the impact on um, the motorcycle unit um, is very significant. We do not have enough um, police officers to patrol as we would to meet our Vision Zero goals. And I don't know, Deputy Chief Ray, if you want to say anything about that. But, you know, when you see an increase in stunt driving, which we've seen in my district, we've seen it in Supervisor Safai's district, stunt driving, the um, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it's just the level of um, duties that you need to perform to keep us safe is somewhat astronomical when you look at all aspects of it. And these staffing numbers are quite concerning. So if you could just touch on that, and then I do want to turn to public comment. Okay, thank you, Supervisor. Um, and I'll, I'll get right to the question. And I know that for... Uh, the folks that are watching uh, online and, and other individuals who might not be familiar with it. I know that you and Supervisor Mandelman and Supervisor Peskin, you know, are, are involved in the, in the CTA and, you know, and, and concerned with all things traffic related in the city. So the impact that we have, the impact that staffing has, reduced staffing has on my bureau, which is the Special Operations Bureau, which includes motorcycle officers, which handle uh, traffic management, uh, traffic investigation, uh, and um, response to uh, stunt driving, commonly referred to as sideshows, uh, is significant. It, it is um, just numbers-wise, I think that currently we are at about, for the motorcycle uh, company, we are at less than 30% of what our uh, historical staffing has, has been. And the impact for us is that the city now has more road users. We have transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, which has brought additional vehicle traffic into the city. Um, we're trying to meet our goals related to, to Vision Zero, working with the SFMTA and Walk SF and other partners. And it does create a challenge, not only with, with the additional uh, use of vehicles, but also with uh, you know, things like rental scooters and, uh, and bicycles. There are a lot more folks using the roadways and traffic company traffic company our motorcycle officers have traditionally been the department's go-to uh, unit officers to work with uh, district stations uh, advocacy groups mta and and all others in the community to address specific traffic concerns there's certainly been uh, an increase in uh, the stunt driving incidents that we've had uh, there was, uh, and, and with those, unfortunately, there's a, po there's a potential for, for violence. We've had a firearms discharge. We've had a, a homicide connected to one in the Ingleside district. Uh, last night, I watched a, a story on uh, one of the local news networks about a similar incident that happened in Livermore, uh, where again, you know, there, there was a shooting. There were shots fired at that, at that incident. So the reduction in our staffing has a huge impact. And then specific to the tragedy that you, re you referred to at uh, Union and Franklin, where the, uh, the young man, the school teacher, uh, was killed in a vehicle collision as a result of a vehicle collision, we feel that impact 
in traffic company as well because our unit also houses the officers responsible for uh, traffic collision investigations, major incidents like that one. So one of our, our ancillary responsibilities, and it's important to people in, in, you know, in the community, is if you get your car towed because you have a suspended license, uh, there's a program, it's called STOP. So you have to respond to traffic company to get through the administrative process to get your vehicle back. Well, the person that, uh, that used to staff that uh, has retired. So now we're using uh, folks that are within traffic company to handle that responsibility. You know, it's a responsibility that requires review by a supervisor. One of the supervisors is also a supervisor who's involved in our, uh, or who's detailed to our traffic collision investigation unit. So there's an impact. So now he's balancing, and, and, and our concern with that is that um, it, delays, it delays the investigative process for us. It, it draws things out. And for us, the impact of that is to that man's family and to his friends and colleagues and, and people in the community who want you know, some, uh, some closure, some finality, and what's going to happen uh, in that process. Um, and if I could add one other thing real quick. Uh, quickly, our bureau also includes uh, the officers who are assigned to security for, for Muni. And, you know, due to the, the reduction in staffing that we have in patrol, which is our primary and most important function, uh, the officers that were in uniform that were responsible for security on Muni um, were all sent back to district stations. And we see the incident that we had two days ago in New York where, you know, this person got on the train and, and without warning, you know, attacked and injured, you know, numerous people. So when that happened in the police department, we have, to, we have to respond to that. We have to put officers out. So now we have to draw officers from other places where we would have normally had officers who were assigned to Muni to be able to get out because we didn't know at the time if that person was acting alone, if that was a coordinated thing where attacks were going to happen in other places. And we have to be mindful of those kind of public safety concerns because I think ultimately, uh, one of our most important goals is prevention. I think everyone would rather that we prevent crime than, than arrest the people responsible for, for victimizing others. Thank you so much for that. And thank you um, all for your presentations and your comments. I, I know that the public might be waiting to weigh in here, so we'll turn it over to them, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Why don't we go to public comment, Mr. Clerk? Yes. Members of the public who wish to invite uh, public comment on this matter and are joining us in person should line up to speak along the side of the room by the windows. As for those joining us remotely, please call 415-655-0001, enter the meeting ID of 2491-567-5344, then press pound and pound again. Once connected, press star three to enter the speaker line. For those already in the queue, please continue the wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted, and that will be your cue to begin your comments. We do have in-person speakers in the room. Uh, you may begin your public comment. Uh, Patricia Boy, Marina Calhalla, Neighbors, Emergence, and Pads. Supervisor Stephanie, could you please ask me a question? What are my, what are my answers to your questions to uh, Officer Lazar? You could just make your comments. Okay. Yeah. okay. Our organization works a little bit differently than the others because we like to, to get results. And first of all, thank you for giving me Captain Jackson. He's outstanding. But we found out that in our neighborhood, and it's very interesting that we have one, two, three, four, five entities of police uh, officers. We have the Presidio, we have Fort Mason, we have the Park and Rec, we have the Library, and we have the Highway Patrol. And three of the five of them had new captains, and we pulled them in a room so that we could work out who had what jurisdictions. And several of the, the other entities within this city have similar problems because of tourism. Uh, it has worked. They now know each other, they're interacting. We need, and because all of them are short of staff, they are trying to help each other out when available, if they possibly can. 
Uh, we have a, another problem that happens that the poor police officers have to deal with. It's our communication system. One of the people that we had was called, there were 17 calls on her last weekend. She came up to in front of restaurants, threw her clothes off, spit on people, threw things. And then as soon as the police showed up, then she would move to another location. We do simply do not have, and we simply do not have enough police officers to handle these. Speaker time has elapsed. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Jim Haas. Um, I'm on the board of the Civic Center Community Benefit District. I'm a partner in the Phoenix Hotel on Eddy Street, and I live at 100 Van Ness. Um, I want to go back to the uh, subject of um, the tenderloin and drug dealers. Uh, as you know, um, they gather together in large packs on certain streets. One of them is the 600 block of Eddy, where the uh, Phoenix is. And um, they just take over the whole street. And, um, you know, in the Tenderloin, uh, we have been complaining. Oh, uh, by the way, I will note that, you know, most of these drug dealers aren't local. They commute in from the East Bay uh, on shifts uh, with their product, and then they leave. And that's a whole different issue of how to deal with them and requires a regional cooperation, which does not seem to be much there. But um, the Tenderloin has complained for years about not enough policing. Uh, we appreciate the additional um, officers who've come, but we've found that they are indeed on their days off. They don't know the neighborhood very well. And they're there from um, 11 to 9. Uh, it's also true that the, um, that the uh, uh, urban alchemy people are there until 9 o'clock. You saw the Chronicle article about what happens after 9 o'clock. Um, and uh, uh, the, one of the points I want to make on behalf of all of us is there doesn't seem to be any strategy. They're, you know, they're out on the street, but there does not seem to be any program to use them in an organized way, which is something that bothers a whole lot of us in the Tenderloin. And so, uh, you know, not only is it a matter of staffing, but it's a matter of how they're utilized. And uh, we feel that the Tenderloin is not getting an adequate amount of... Thank you. Seeing the end of in-person speakers, we are checking to see if we have any remote attendees who would like to speak. If you're on the phone and have not already done so, please press star three and then wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted and that, and <laughs> that will be your cue to begin your comments. Uh, I'd like to also note that um, Supervisor Mandelman has been uh, appointed to serve on this committee in place of Supervisor Haney. Uh, we have 36 callers with 21, 28 in line to speak. Can we have the first remote caller, please? Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Suzette Covell, and I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at Taj Campton Place Hotel at Union Square. I'm calling to support SFPD in securing the necessary resources to increase staffing levels and recruit new officers in order to increase safety for everyone. Protecting the SFPD budget is important to my livelihood and the fiscal vi viability of my company because as the Director of Sales and Marketing, I am now spending my precious face-to-face -face time with clients, convincing them that San Francisco is still a safe and wonderful city in which to send their clients to. I can rarely even get to my goal of selling my hotel specifically. As a salesperson, I can easily move to selling another hotel in another city, state, or country. Work from home has opened up all possibilities. Let's please work together to once again bring San Francisco to its full and wonderful potential as a desirable destination where both residents and visitors can feel safe from crime. Thank you very much for all of your service to San Francisco and for your support of the SFPD. Thank you. Can we have the next caller, please? Good 
afternoon. My name is Daryl Little Jr. and I'm representing the Bay Area Council. I'm calling in today to voice my organization's support of providing the San Francisco Police Department with the resources needed to increase their staffing levels as the current number of officers are down by nearly 500. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can we hear from the next caller? Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Gary Cox, and I'm representing the Axiom Hotel at Powell and Market. I'm also a resident of District 6, living in Soma for the past eight plus years. I'm calling in, support in, in to support the San Francisco Police Department in securing the necessary resources to increase staffing levels and recruit new officers in order to keep us all safe. Protecting these resources for the San Francisco Police Department is of vital importance to my entire team and the visitors to our city. I have personally been the victim of crime, as have been a few of my team members. I have lost several team members as a result of their fear of working in this city. This is unacceptable to me and needs to be addressed. The funding to increase the police presence in this city is absolutely necessary for us to feel safe and for the city to return to business. Please protect our works. Uh, residents and visitors by supporting the resources needed for San Francisco PD to achieve full staffing levels. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Can we have the next caller, please? Good afternoon, Chair and Supervisors. Eliana Binder, Policy Associate for Glide. Each day we see the challenging realities of those suffering on our streets. Issues including skyrocketing wealth inequality, systemic racism, and the lack of shelter access, affordable housing, and mental health and substance use services are driving many of the persistent co-occurring crises in our streets. Focusing solely on criminalization and increased policing will never address the root causes. True solutions must be anchored in life-affirming resources, which will also reduce the workload of police officers. We need to reinstitute self-referral to the shelter system, which will result in fewer people suffering with nowhere to go on our streets. This pre-existing policy has been blocked for more than two years. Additionally, if the Compassionate Alternative Response Team were implemented, police would no longer be one of the main responses to homelessness. The report referenced in this hearing identifies extraordinarily long response times for priority C calls. With the CART program in place, and it is already partially funded, police officers would not respond to priority C calls related to homelessness. Furthermore, if the police stopped engaging in racially biased non-public safety related traffic stops, known as pretextual stops, SFPD would also have more resources to respond to more severe situations. These problems are institutional and deep, and it's not a matter of which trainings the department implements or what new officers they hire, Fishing expeditions unnecessarily fray trust with communities of color who are disproportionately targeted by these stops. Lastly, implementing supervised consumption services to scale citywide would be life-saving for people who use drugs and a result in fewer officer hours engaging with those who use drugs on the street. We should not rely on law enforcement to further engage in issues for which it is not the appropriate response. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Good afternoon, Supervisors, and thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for calling this uh, very important hearing. My name is Kevin Carroll. I'm the President and CEO of the Hotel Council of San Francisco. I'm also a lifelong resident of San Francisco, and I currently live in the Sunnyside District uh, 7. I'm calling both as a resident, but also on behalf of the hotel industry workers to express support for securing the necessary resources to increase the staffing levels recruitment of new officers and also to ensure the safety of our employees, residents, and workers. You've all received a copy of a letter that the Hotel Council, along with Unite Here Local 2, the International Association of Theatrical and Stage Employees, IOTC Local 16, and the San Francisco Building and Trade Council have all signed on to in support of safety for our employees, many of whom live in San Francisco. This letter is to demonstrate our, our, our united support to, uh, for San Francisco police officers and for the resources that are needed uh, to uh, keep the staffing levels where they should be. Our employees continue to experience acts of violence uh, daily while they're traveling to and from work, and they're asking for more protection. The Hotel Council with partner organizations commissioned a recent survey of voters across San Francisco about their views on crime and safety. 
Voters are very concerned about crime and safety and believe that elected officials are not doing enough to address that. Two very significant findings that apply directly to this hearing are 79% of San Francisco voters surveyed say they, the presence of police makes them feel safer. And 8% of voters support increasing the number of officers in high crime areas. I call today uh, to represent the thousands of industry workers and also to ask that you protect our workers, residents, and visitors by supporting the resources needed to achieve full staffing levels. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can we have the next caller, please? Uh, thank you, supervisors and uh, uh, police staff. My name is Randall Scott. I'm the executive director of the Fisherman's Wharf Community Benefit District. I'm calling in to uh, strongly support our city investing in our officers and in whatever it takes to increase the staffing levels and quality of life of our officers. Um, I think that's been touched on a number of times, and I would love to see um, more community policing, which will come from the multi-hundreds that we need to attract to our city. Thank you so much, and God bless San Francisco. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, Chair Marr and Supervisors. My name is Cassandra Costello, and I'm calling in today on behalf of the San Francisco Travel Association. And I'm calling today to ensure that the city is doing everything in their power to make sure our city is as safe and welcoming as it can be. Thank you to Supervisor Stephanie for calling this hearing today to shed light on the alarming staffing deficits that the SFPD is contending with. We are clearly gravely below where we should be on the number of police officers we need to prevent and respond to serious crime. We need to work together to be creative and find incentives and recruitment tools to develop our pipeline of officers to bring us up to adequate staffing levels and to complement the great work that the city has done around building our network of response tools such as the street crisis response team. When we look at the need for public safety and ratios of officers needed per capita, we have to also be considering the number of employees and visitors who come to the city each day, vastly increasing our population in need. In 2019, we had 25 million visitors visit San Francisco. We are in this together to partner with you to recover, rebuild, and restore our essential public safety response tools. We love the city just as much as all of you do and are working really hard to make sure we can recover and rebuild. We really appreciate your time and attention to this serious matter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we have the next caller? Hello, Superv Hello, Supervisors. My name is Joanne Desmond, and I represent the Theatrical Stage Employees, IAT Local 16, one of the signatories just mentioned by uh, Mr. Carroll. Our industry has experienced an almost 100% shutdown during COVID. Our members desperately need to return to work, and we need to make sure our city is safe, clean, and inviting to attract business. Police presence is vital for workers and visitors alike to ensure all of our safety and well-being. On behalf of our 1,500 plus members, we strongly support full funding for public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Hello, supervisors. My name is Tashona Chisholm and I am a resident uh, here in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. I'm calling in to support SFPD in securing the resources necessary uh, to increase the staffing levels, uh, as well as the, the footbeat patrols in the area. I'm also a, uh, a hospitality professional in the security field, and I've been seeing an increase in assaults. Uh, we want to make sure that our team members and uh, our people that are visiting San Francisco feel safe, and I think with the necessary uh, tools to increase uh, the staffing levels would help SFPD out tremendously and increase the safety for visitors and help bring our city back. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen. Thank you. Can we have our next caller, please? Hello, Supervisors. My name is Amy Cleary, and I am representing the Golden Gate Restaurant Association. 
The GTRA represents hundreds of local independent restaurants and cafes in San Francisco. The safety of our employees and our customers is a real need and a concern. We urge you to please support this request. We believe it is very important to have police officers out on the street engaging in community policing and addressing crime. If our customers, both locals and tourists, and our employees do not feel safe in the city, our businesses will suffer. The recovery of our industry and the city as a whole is dependent on, on safety, and a fully staffed SSPD will play an important role protecting not only our citizens, but also our economy. We are urgently requesting city leaders fund the resources needed to achieve the full staffing levels that have been outlined by the department. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, can we have our next caller? Hello, Supervisors. My name is Kelly Powers, and I'm the Director of the Hotel Council of San Francisco. We are in full support of any creative solutions to increase staffing and police resources and address the low morale as a serious hindrance to officers choosing to work in San Francisco. Crisis uh, depleted staffing numbers directly correlate with delayed response times, increased crimes to our employees and residents, unreported crimes, in a situation that encourages criminals to come to San Francisco because they realize there is limited police staffing and see it as an opportunity. In essence, leaving residents and employees vulnerable to becoming victims. Our employees at the Hotel Council, they share stories of violence that is nothing short of harrowing. We need our city leaders to prioritize this serious issue I'm gravely disappointed that it's allowed to reach this critical level that we're here today to talk about. It should have been addressed much earlier. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for addressing this issue, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Hi, Supervisors. My name is David Harrison, and I'm calling on behalf of BOMA San Francisco and also as a resident of District 5 in the Inner Sunset. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to all of you, Supervisor Stephanie, Supervisor Marr, Supervisor Haney, and Supervisor Mandelman for your attention to this issue. Uh, I'm calling today to voice BOMA's support for providing the adequate resources for the SFPD to meet full staffing levels. Unfortunately, as we try to repopulate downtown, concern about personal safety remains the top issue identified by our members, their office tenants, and our retail tenants as well. With so many additional challenges to this effort, it's critical that we do everything we can to ensure that our residents, our office workers, our retailers, and our visitors feel safe. Recognizing the current challenge and potential for them to get much worse, we're supportive of making the appropriate uh, budget, uh, budget assessments to address this challenging issue. We respectfully request that come budget season, we provide SFPD with the resources needed to recruit and retain new officers. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Peter Hart, and I'm representing the Lower Knob Hill Polk Gulch neighborhood. Uh, this is my first time calling into the hearing, and I'm calling with my full support for the SFPD to secure resources to keep our residents and visitors safe. Uh, I've lived in San Francisco for over 15 years, and frankly, I've never felt as unsafe as I do today. Over the last two years, my car has been broken into twice. I've had numerous theft incidents at my residence. Um, in fact, my building garage was robbed recently, and my neighbors didn't even call to make a report. And they didn't because previous incidents, no one uh, seems to come. It takes hours, um, and there just isn't the deployment that's needed. I recently returned to the office and walked to Union Square regularly. Um, frankly, the walks become brutal. Uh, you're accosted by transients every day. Our streets aren't safe. Our police need help. Please fund the resources needed to achieve the outlined full staffing levels and equipment needed. Thank you. Thank you. Can we our next caller, please? Hello, Supervisors. My name is Terry Lewis, and I'm the Complex General Manager of the Hilton Union Square in the Park 55 Hotel. I'm a resident of San Francisco, and I live in District 3. Above all things, the safety of my 1,000 plus employees, the residents of San Francisco, and our visitors is of utmost importance. Accordingly, I'm asking this committee to support the resources needed for our SFPD to achieve full staffing levels that have been outlined for the department. 
COVID-19 has had an outsized impact on all of us over the past few years, and I hope we finally turned a corner with this pandemic. As individual tourism and business travel begin returning to a semblance of our new normal, we can't forget the indispensable role that safety improvements will play in our city's ongoing recovery. Again, I urge city leaders to fund the resources needed by SFPD to secure full staffing levels. It will vitally benefit our employees, our neighborhoods, and our guests. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Supervisors, my name is Francisco De Costa. Yesterday, I addressed this issue at the police commission. The police commissioners were astounded by what they heard. This presentation that was given today muddies the waters. We, ha we should all know that the strength of our police force should be over 2,000 and is about 1,100. And so this 1,600 figure or 1,500 figure is a lie. Now, we have to address this situation on a war footing. I happen to know all the officers who are sitting there in room 250. They know me very well. We need to address this situation on a war footing. The supervisors have left us, let us down. The mayor has let us down. The controller has let us down. Who is suffering are the constituents, the taxpayers. They are suffering every single day. Assaulted, car breaking, home breaking. This nonsense must stop. We need a plan on a war footing. An emergency, maybe, for the whole city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have our next caller? Good afternoon, supervisors and representatives from San Francisco Police Department. I'm Carolyn Kennedy, a community leader in District 8 and leader of Rescue SF. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. It is sobering and scary how limited our field police resources are, and it matches San Franciscans' perceptions. Neighbors in my community do not feel safe. Neighbors have seen a market rise in lawlessness and crime in our community. Many have experienced crime themselves. I urge SFPD to increase its patrol force. I support investments to recruit and retain officers. The labor market is much more competitive. Offering a package that incoming officers really value is critical. And Commander Jones is right. This is a five plus year effort. During the budget process, please advocate for and fund the hiring of more, more officers and a more competitive recruitment and compensation package. Thank you for holding this hearing and for listening to my comment. Thank you. Uh, next caller, please. Hi, my name is William Jake, resident District 8. Please vote to fund increasing the, staff, the staffing levels for the police department. Break-ins, assaults, robberies, property theft, vandalism, hate crimes, Drugs, shootings, all commonplace these days. Everybody knows that San Francisco is not safe anymore. There's more trouble than ever, and people disrupting our city know they probably aren't going to get caught. The majority of the citizens of San Francisco support our outstanding police officers, and we know that inadequate funding for the police department is one of the main reasons that crime is out of control here. This is your chance to use your leadership positions to change that. We need more police officers and we need you to support them. So please help us and don't skimp on the police budget. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Hi, Supervisors. My name is Stephanie, and I'm calling in to urge you to increase the staffing levels for San Francisco's police department. As you know, the police department currently needs to add more than 500 
level of staffing. As a resident living here since 1996, I didn't need an independent study to tell me the streets are less safe. My car was just stolen from in front of my home. Not smash and grab, the entire car was taken. We have been parking that car on the street for almost 20 years here without incident. Volume of police required for public safety is a separate issue from police reform, and the two should not be conflated. In my opinion, it is going to take more than just you agreeing to raise staff levels to attract and hire good candidates for the academy. Our current police commission, our current incompetent DA, and many of you on this board repeated, repeatedly publicly display a disdain for police officers specifically and the profession generally and routinely undermine support for them. I cannot imagine how these brave officers wake up every day to deal with all they deal with, knowing folks like you and our incompetent and dangerous DA are working to do everything they can to undermine them. Until this Board of Supervisors values the hard and important work that police officers do and value the importance of their contribution to public safety, what normal person would want to work here? And for the record, there's an abundance of support for our police officers from everyday citizens, and it's high time this Board recognized that. Our city is no longer a safe city, and this is just a fact. Hiring more police officers is only one of the things that is needed to restore public safety, and that is also a fact, and you should understand that. It would be hypocritical for you to sit here and pretend that you can public safety seriously and then turn around and vote on no, no one increasing the staff level of the SFPD. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for caring about public safety and calling this meeting. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Yes, good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is Wes Tyler, and I'm the General Manager at the Chancellor Hotel on Union Square. I'm calling to support the San Francisco Police Department in securing the necessary resources to increase staffing levels, retain officers, and recruit new officers. With the current number of officers down by hundreds and resignations and retirements increasing, I'm urgently requesting that the city leaders correct course from this terrible path we've been led down. Recent crime stats in Union Square prove that increased police presence reduces crime, and the surveys show that people, it makes people feel safer. Please protect our workers, residents, and visitors by supporting the resources needed for the San Francisco Police Department to achieve full staffing levels. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to get, do a quick check-in that if you are on the phone and have not already done so, please dial star three and then wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted and that will be a cue to begin your comments. We currently have 10 more people in line for public comment. Okay, we have our next caller. Hello, supervisors. My name is Caitlin Fear, and I'm a resident of District 3 Knob Hill, and this is my first time calling in. I'm calling to support SFPD in retaining and recruiting officers to keep residents and visitors safe. I would like to feel comfortable visiting any neighborhood to support local businesses where I currently do not out of fear of harassment or worse. I've been chased outside of my own place of employment by a woman not in her right state of mind. I have been spat on and urinated on. I've had food and used needles thrown at me and I've had my car broken into all in broad daylight. I have been verbally accosted and witnessed open air drug use too many times to count. I firmly believe SFPD should not have to prioritize the crimes they respond to out of a lack of staffing and resource shortage. Please protect the people of San Francisco by supporting resources for SFPD. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon. My name is Katie Liddell, and I have been a San Francisco resident of District 6 since 1995. I have been involved with the police before and since joining Southern Station's Community Police Advisory Board as a charter member. I have seen and heard firsthand what our officers deal with and how they react. They are a great force, but we need to grow that force, and we need to better support the staff that we have. My neighbors and I will feel safer with more officers to protect us. Please increase funding so that more officers can be hired. Please make San Francisco a safer city. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? 
Hello, Supervisors. My name is Alan Hopkins. I'm the Complex General Manager with Wyndham Destinations, and I'm a resident of Selma in the heart of District 6. This is my first time calling into a hearing, and I felt it important to do so, as this topic is critically important. I'm calling to fully support the San Francisco PD in securing the necessary resources to increase staffing levels, recruit and recruit new officers in order to keep us all safe. Protecting the SFPD budget is important to me because I care about my team members. I care about my family that all live here in the heart of San Francisco. I have personally seen too many crimes happen, including break-ins into my own home building. I've seen car smash and grab robberies happen in the middle of the day to my hotel guests. I know, and I know too many people that are fearful walking on our city streets. It is critical for the recovery of our city that both residents and visitors in our city feel safe and a fully staffed police department is critical to make this happen. Please protect our workers, residents, and visitors by supporting the resources needed for the SFPD to achieve full staffing levels. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Can we have our next caller, please? Hello, my name is Scott Matheson. I'm a resident of the mission. I've closely followed the staffing situation at, F at SFPD since 2017. I've spoke with many officers about their futures and also look closely at SFPD data. Here are factors you should consider when it comes to SFPD staffing and the budget. Number one, in 2016, the city's target meeting response time for a priority calls for service was four minutes. Today, in 2022, the target is now set as an eight minute meeting response time. We've successfully doubled to eight minutes the time it takes SFPD to respond to the most urgent requests. If armed gunmen just kicked in your front door at night and were assaulting your family, half of the time, SFPD is insufficiently staffed and will not be able to get there in under eight minutes. That prospect is terrifying. Number two, SFPD is losing through lateral transfers, retirements, mandates, officers leaving, law enforcement altogether, one officer per day. That is what it was just this past month. I've heard over 300 officers are considering retirement in July. Combined with current officer shortages, the department could be over 800 officers below recommended staffing levels by July 1. The last two academy classes graduated 21 officers. Historically, only 14 of those will make it through their first year. This is a shortfall in staffing that will take decades to repair. Also consider only eight people showed up at the last physical fitness screening for SFPD. Point three. Few veteran officers have lateral transferred into SFPD in the past five years. Why? Meanwhile, law enforcement agencies throughout the country are showing up here in SF to do recruiting fairs and make job offers with five-figure signing bonuses, bonuses to some of the finest trained police officers in the country. Additionally, there are communities in the Bay Area where officials treat their police departments with respect and are offering significantly higher starting salaries. In summary, I urge you to show support to police officers, Speaker time increase has the budget, elapsed. and take. Thank you. Can we have our next caller, please? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Frank Rock. I was born and raised here in San Francisco, California. I live out in the Excelsior District. I work downtown at the Tenderloin. I'm reaching out to you in support the necessary resources to allow the San Francisco Police Department to include staffing levels and recruit new officers in order to keep workers, residents, and visitors safe. I feel that it is important to have more police officers on the street engaging in community policing and addressing crime. The recovery of our city is dependent on safety and a full staff. San Francisco Police Department will play an important role protecting not only our citizens, but our economy. Myself, as I, as a servant working down here at a hotel, I was assaulted a couple of days ago, ensuring guest safety. From a military point of view, if you really want to hear it, I'm a military veteran. We are outnumbered, outforced by the homeless population. Before the pandemic, we had major conventions canceled. Tourism has went down. You as our public leaders need to stand up now, rise, and bring back to San Francisco. San Francisco is currently down 500 police officers. We are urgently requesting city leaders like you to fund the resources needed to achieve the full staffing levels that have been outlined by our department. 
I just want you to hear that from me, and thank you for your support. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, supervisors and staff. This is Taylor Safford, the president and CEO of Pier 39. I'm calling to support full staffing for SFPD. Officer deficits affect visitor, employee, and resident safety. We all know that. We've seen a significant increase in petty crime in the wharf in the last two years. And for the first time in my memory, my employees and tenants are reporting that they don't feel safe walking to their cars at night. We need the city to be safe to recover from what we've all experienced in the last two years. Thank you for your support of this important initiative. Thank you. Uh, next caller, please. Hello. I am a resident of San Francisco. I've lived here for six months, and I'm appalled by the state of the city. And I think it's directly related to the lack of police funding. I strongly urge supervisors to ignore the ideological nonsense of supervisors Chan and Preston and go forward and fund the police and actually start working for your voters instead of people on Twitter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Hello, can you hear me? 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 Yes. You will need to turn down your background uh, device to avoid the echo. You may proceed. Are you still there? Uh, they did hang up. Uh, most likely, hopefully, they'll call back. Can we have our next caller? Thank you, supervisors and officers. My name is Valerie Saito. I'm the Area Director of Colleague Experience for Hyatt Hotels. The safety of our colleagues and guests are our number one priority. Our, ho our hotels are open 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so police support is critical. We experience significant es escalations in crime in and around our hotels. Our colleagues and security teams do not want to feel like they are putting their lives at risk by coming to work. We employ over 500 employees in the city. They do their very best to ensure our guests who are visiting San Francisco have an incredible experience. The increases in crime is undermining the recovery of our business. This unfortunately contributes to fewer shifts, fewer new hotels, and less jobs. Our city and industry need your help and support to fully fund the resources needed by the police department. This support is needed now more than ever. Thank you for making this a priority and for listening to my comments. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, my name is Ellen Sotu, and I am a project director for the Civic Center and Mid Market Community Benefit District. Um, and I'm calling today because both of our uh, community benefit districts are in support of full staffing level for the San Francisco Police Department. Um, our management staff and our field staff open ears from the businesses, the residents, the workers, and the visitors to. Um, and all of our, of our stakeholders that the presence of SSPD officers on our sidewalks and plazas make a very positive difference, and they, it, it, it does increase their feeling of safety. Um, I, think in, I think in particular, I would say I was really struck by the uh, numbers that I heard from Commander Vaswani, that there are only um, one lieutenant, three sergeants, and 12 officers working the narcotic units in, in San Francisco. Uh, when we have hundreds of drug dealers every day uh, that we can see out there. Uh, so please, uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Stephanie, for calling this uh, hearing, and uh, we look forward to uh, following um, the future meetings on that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next caller, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Gideon Kramer. I am a 43-year uh, resident of San Francisco, uh, and I am calling. Um, I joined Rescue SF and urging the Board of Supervisors to increase staffing levels 
for the city, for the San Francisco Police Department. Uh, I would like to say that it baffles me that this hearing is even required and that we have so many studies. It's patently obvious that the city is in serious trouble and the fact that we're questioning whether to have sufficient police uh, staffing is <laughs> should not even be a question. The police department currently needs to add more than 500 officers to meet the recommended staffing level in the independent report. In practice, this means that the police department currently does not have the resources to keep our city safe. We see it in the department's inability to end open air drug tra trafficking in the Tenderloin and elsewhere. We see it in the lawlessness in Union Square and the high volume of property crimes in recent years. Residents do not feel safe and that needs to change. I urge the Board of Supervisors to provide sufficient funding to allow the department to increase staffing and ensure public safety for all San Franciscans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we hear from our next caller? Good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Marissa Rodriguez. I'm representing Union Square Alliance. We represent hundreds of members and thousands of stakeholders in the heart of San Francisco. I'm also a San Francisco native and a District 3 resident and seem to be a District 7 resident. I'm calling to support San Francisco Police Department in securing the necessary resources that they need for staffing levels, for recruiting our new officers, for training new and existing officers in order to keep our workers, our residents, and all visitors to San Francisco safe. Protecting San Francisco's budget is important because many of our community members here in San Francisco and including Union Square have been victims of crime, resulting in negative impact for all San Franciscans. We've lost so many strong service jobs because people are afraid to work here and to visit here. Help us please recover our city and support our police. I want to thank San Francisco, the San Francisco Police Department, Deputy Chief Lazar, Captain Jones, Commander Pereira for their comments and their hard work in supporting the, the department, as well as I want to acknowledge the potential burnout of our officers. There are not enough. They are working so hard to try to keep our city safe, those who are still here. They need our support. I want to continue to support them. In addition, we need to support our city and, and the heart of our city as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Supervisors, I want to applaud you for holding this hearing today. Unfortunately, the reality is there are colleagues of yours on the Board of Supervisors who have done nothing but demonize this profession. They do nothing to promote the honorable profession, which is constantly under the microscope. Those of you who are at this hearing today should encourage your fellow colleagues to stop the demonization, to encourage young constituents to get involved in keeping the city a safe place for all. Please continue shining a light on these issues. The public deserves to know how dire the situation is. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. I'm a long-time resident of San Francisco, and I've lived in different districts. Um, my neighbors and my friends have all experienced car window being smashed when they're just parking the car overnight on the street. Or one of my friends came to visit from out of town and just parked the street the car on the street for like 10 minutes and was a victim of the crime. And all these horrible things that we see on the news is really happening. It's not some conspiracy or conservative attack on San Francisco. I'm calling in to support of adequate funding of police. That's the only way that we can feel safe. And as a regular resident, every time we walk into the supermarket or a drugstore or the Apple store, it makes us feel safe to see the officers in the front protecting us. And until we have the district attorney recalled, these repeated be released from jail. As a uh, normal resident and law-abiding citizen and Chinese American, I don't feel safe on the street. So please continue to support the adequate funding of the police. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Yes, hi, my name is, can you hear me? Hello? 
Please proceed. Yes, hi, my name is Ashley Lang Ferguson. I'm a resident here in San Francisco. I'm also a member of Rescue SF, CPAB, and Clean Streets. And I just strongly urge you to please increase funding for the police department. Um, no disrespect, but the visuals around Union Square at the time of those massive robberies was extremely enticing for those watching on the news, but the rest of us who are citizens who actually have to live here, those police officers were down there protecting the tourists and the expensive retail stores at an expense to the rest of us who are actually taxpayers. I'm in an industry where an awful lot of people get recruited by other companies and they're given sign-on bonuses. And what we've started doing lately is doing retention bonuses. So rather than leave, losing our good people to other companies, we're now giving the people who have stayed with us and tried a true retention bonuses. I strongly urge you to do that with the law enforcement officers that are here now. I applaud them all. Um, they're out there putting their life on the line for us every single day. And they deserve the respect, but they also deserve to be compensated adequately. Thank you very much for listening to me. Goodbye. Thank you. I just want to do one last check-in of people who are on the line. If you do wish to provide public comment, please press star three to line up to speak. The system will indicate you have been unmuted. Uh, when, when it is time for you to speak, uh, you, you, the system will indicate you have been unmuted, and that will be your you to begin your comments. We have five callers left on the line to speak at this time. Can we have our next caller? Dear uh, members of the Board of Supervisors, I'm Ellen Grant. So I'm a, a member of District 8. I've been a San Francisco resident for um, more than 20 years, and I've got two teenage sons who, who go to school here. Um, I'm writing actually as a co-founder of the Mothers Against Drug Deaths. We are a nonpartisan organization of mothers who, and, and families affected by the drug epidemic in San Francisco. And we are urging the Board of Supervisors to increase staffing levels for the San Francisco Police Department. We wrote a, um, a detailed letter, um, which we sent to you. And I'm just gonna highlight a few key areas. Okay, so San Francisco's open drug markets, which operate in broad daylight without any concern about I illegality, draw people in from other cities and states, including the kids of many of our members. According to some reports, thousands of our unsheltered citizens have come to San Francisco for the inexpensive and easy access to lethal drugs, including fentanyl. Since we launched our group, literally hundreds of people have contacted us, many sharing their stories about how their loved ones have been affected by the drug crisis in San Francisco and blaming the city's permissive attitude. Below are some ex excerpts that they've shared. And so I'm going to read just a couple. One is, <clears throat> my son frequents the Tenderloin every day and sometimes for days at a time. He's addicted to fentanyl and meth. I'm infuriated about how this is being handled there. I've thought about writing the people in charge to let them know if something happens to my son, I'm holding them accountable. It's a daily thing for my son. Da, 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 da. He's told me about how he thought he'd be arrested a dozen times, but the cops either turn their heads or rough him up and let him go. Uh, here's another. Last time I saw my son, he was in the John Muir ICU in January. He was attacked in the tenderloin, and someone drove him to my house. I called 911 immediately. They put a metal plate in his jaw, so his jaw is on the right is still healing, swollen. He was released back out into the street. Since then, he was arrested for a gun and fentanyl possession on February 23rd. I think he's living in a tent or in the new Lincoln Center. His friends text me and Speaker call me as I left. see him. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Daniel Hertzstein. I'm calling on behalf of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. And we represent uh, about a thousand businesses of all sizes in San Francisco, and that includes over 250,000 employees who live and work here in the city. And the top concern we hear consistently from them is public safety, and that they don't feel safe here working in our city. And it, it frankly has been a major impact as we try to bring back our economic core and continue to see an economically successful city of San Francisco. And I, I want to thank Supervisor Stephanie um, and you all for having this hearing today. Um, recruitment and retention of our police officers is a vital importance to making sure that uh, San Franciscans and our employees feel safe. Um, and we hope that you continue to keep taking these issues very, very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please.
Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie, for calling this meeting. I urge you to increase the staffing levels for the San Francisco Police Department. As you know, the Police Department currently needs to add more than 500 officers to meet the recommended level of staffing. As a lifelong San Franciscan, I don't need an independent study to tell me that the streets are less safe. I have personally witnessed multiple retail thefts that I stupidly tried to stop. My home was broken into last year, which is extremely stressful and destabilizing. My car has been broken into three times in the last two years. An elderly Asian man was severely beaten just walking down the street around the corner from my home last year. <clears throat> and I'm sure you've seen the news today. There have been uh, stabbings and people are trying to cut uh, women's fingers off to get their wedding rings. The volume of police required for public safety is a separate issue from police reform and the two should not be confused. In my opinion, it is going to take more than just you agreeing to raise staff levels to attract and hire good candidates for the academy. Our current police commission, our current incompetent DA, and many of you on this board repeatedly publicly display a disdain for public police officers specifically and the profession generally and routinely undermine support for them. I cannot imagine how these brave officers wake up every day to deal with all that they deal with knowing folks like you and our incompetent and dangerous DA are working to do everything they can to undermine them. So until the board values the hard and important work that police officers do, and, the, and value the importance of their contribution to public safety, what normal person would want to work here or live here? And for the record, there is an abundance of support for our police from everyday citizens, and it's high time that the board recognize that. Our city is no longer a safe city, and this is just a fact. Hiring more police officers is only one of the things that is needed to restore public safety. Obviously, the DA must be recalled, and you should understand that. It would be hypocritical for you to sit here and pretend to take public safety seriously and then turn Speaker around and say no elapsed. on increasing this. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, this is Marlene Morgan of Cathedral Hill Neighbors Association and the Cathedral Hill Safety Committee. Uh, want to support uh, um, adequate staffing, upgraded staffing for the city of San Francisco. Uh, our neighborhood had to go out and hire a private security patrol about five years ago because we were dealing with so much, so many problems that the police officers could not respond to adequately. We have a very close working relationship with uh, the Northern Police Station. We just met with the captain. We've asked what we could do for them. They've been very helpful. And one of the things that we know we can do is ask for adequate police staffing and uh, police compensation. And I just wanna add that this is also a great opportunity while we're beefing up our police staffing is that we know that the officers have addressed or the department has addressed a lot of the uh, compliance issues around training. It's a great time for the city of San Francisco to, to tell the department what we see the vision is for their officers and the role the officers play so that they're not constantly confused by changing back and forth what they can do, what they can't do. It's very, very difficult for them. We have a great relationship with them, and we want to have a better one. And I also add that I am a member also of Rest USF. Part of our concern around staffing is, of course, handling homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have our next caller? Good afternoon, this is Anastasia Yovanopoulos from District 8. The hearing is about police staffing. I, I heard about the current staffing levels and I'm thinking that one way to improve this is, I don't know if you are paying the, the applicants. First of all, you've gotta waive that application fee to get more people to come in. You've got to screen them before they go to the training, and then the training has to be coordinated so that they get on to the job, so that it goes one, two, three. If they're screened and they're, they're you know, qualified, then bring them on right away. And as far as housing goes, our housing policy is terrible. You've got to get the prices of the rent so that the police can afford to live here. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was our last caller on the public comment call-in line. Thank you. Public comment is now closed. I, <clears throat> I do want to thank everyone who called in for public comment and shared your perspectives on this extremely important and urgent issue. And I think it reflects how, um, how much concern there is across the city among residents and businesses about public safety and, and the need for us to ensure that our, our police department is, is, is staffed adequately. And I think this hearing w was extremely informative at, at looking at what, what the, the problem is right now and, and also what's needed to address it and particularly a real um, proactive and strategic uh, retention and recruitment plan from the department. So I'm, I look forward to working with Supervisor Stephanie on, on supporting that as we move ahead. And thank you so much, Supervisor Stephanie, for your leadership and for calling for this hearing. Thank you, Chair Mar, and I, I do um, want to thank you as well for scheduling this hearing and to all the callers who called in, to my colleagues for their um, great questions. Uh, I do believe that one of our primary responsibilities as elected officials is to keep San Franciscans safe, and I want to thank SFPD for showing up here today and um, for your presentation. I look forward to our continued work together on this issue, and I encourage all those that called in and who are watching to continue to um, follow this discussion as we go through budget negotiations because we need to properly invest in our police department uh, to uh, meet the needs of so many that are calling and so that we can do the preventative work that so many are demanding as well. So at this point, um, I think we can move to file this hearing and um, we'll bring this up, of course, um, throughout the budget negotiations and I will uh, continue to focus on this issue until it's resolved. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Mr. Clerk, can you please call the roll on the motion to, to file this hearing? Uh, yes, on the motion to file the matter. Um, Supervisor Mandelman is absent. Um, Vice Chair Stephanie. Stephanie, aye. Chair Mar. Aye. Mar, aye. The motion passes without objection. Great. Is there any further business? That completes the agenda for today. We are adjourned. SF Gov TV, San Francisco Government Television.